One, two, three, say it together. Ow! Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Yes, I'm here. And I'm alive. Despite best efforts of both myself and one of my best friends to, to remedy that situation. Um, and when I say remedy that situation... Okay, so here is what I want you to picture. Two friends, we've known each other since we were about, ooh, three years old. Um, that level of male friendship. Go on a hike together. Just a quick hike, because it's Mother's Day, but um, unfortunately one of them doesn't have their mum anymore. You all know I have mine, so it's not me. And um, so we went on a hike to sort of help, but, uh, you know, that's sort of something to keep their mind off it. And just a, it was supposed to be just a quick hour one. We sort of got to the point at which you can decide to make it an hour or you can make it a longer one. And of course, we're being typical males went, ah, oh, we barely worked up. You know, we're only wearing 20 kilogram weight vests and each carrying 20 kilograms in our pack, plus two liters of water, which we're not allowed to drink or other chocolate bars, which we're not allowed to eat because... You know, if we eat or drink anything of that, then we are emitting weakness and we will not eat or drink till we get back to the cars. So, of course, went for longer. About four and a half hours, five hours later, <laughs> uh, missed lunch, so haven't had lunch today. Uh, got to the edge of Headley because we were doing, we left Headley, walked down from Headley, went round sort of Box Hill. Right the way, and if you're ever in the, this Perth area, sorry, where I come from, uh, there's a lovely viewing place called Box Hill. You can walk right down the hill, walk uh, walk through the sort of valley a bit, and walk across some stepping stones, and then walk right up the hill again. And it's um, it's a nice nice hill. Uh, anyway, so it did all that. Got to the edge of Headley. Went ah, oh, barely tired. Yeah, let's up the pace a bit. Why up the pace a bit? Let's race. Anyway, um, I'm alive. I'm alive. Uh, I I say I won the race back to the cars because I think hand touching the car beats head touching the car. Because hand is something you're placing to touch the car, whereas head, you're falling over and collapsing. So I think hand beats head. But we officially are calling it a tie. Anyway, uh, that's why today's questions, because honestly, I'm not sure if I'm going to collapse on you all from having done all that. <laughs> At least, well, I could order a Chinese this evening. I'm fairly sure I could either order a Chinese takeaway or a big pizza, because I've, I've probably done enough calories I could eat a huge amount and still be on a diet. Hello, everyone. So let's answer the questions. Now I've got the embarrassing story out the way. Um, hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carmen. Hello, Rick Zava. Sorry again for being late, but that's why. Then I came home and walked to the dogs. And, um, yeah. I suppose I can be proud. Fitbit-wise, my Fitbit is incredibly happy with me today. Back-wise, the back is less so. Hello, Eric Zava. Hello, Vice Admiral Nelson. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, everyone. Um, you said the Swedish is an AEW suitable. Can you elaborate why is it, it is, it's the wrong airframe for the job? When a fairy tried to make the Spearfish an AEW with the Spearfish Guppy in 1945, Spearfish Guppy has a pretty much redesigned airframe from uh, the Spearfish in that it might look out externally to an extent similar, but internally the airframe has been completely redesigned and rejigged. It's basically a new aircraft. Hello, Vision. Sorry, it's only a quick hello and the lunch is up, but I hope you had a good lunch. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Andrew Paul. Hello, Christopher Ryan. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, I'm Melanie 6240. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Uh, yes, I was late for class, but that's because 
Honestly, the war I, I estimated the time it would take me to get from the shower to the office, and it took longer. <laughs> oh, hello, Admiral BT. Hello, DG40. Hello, Zaski. One is not late if one has posted notice that the originally scheduled time for the gathering is no longer valid. Yeah. Uh, mm. Bitchin, Russian bombs would hit the UK before the US and Canada. Yeah. Thanks to both timing and to um, distance. Hi, John Sal. Mm. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I did. I did. A, I when if ever I'm late, I do tend to do a post on the community page, especially if I'm changing things and if I'm being late. Um, I try and be helpful. <laughs> Melanie sixty forty guy. You de Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Don't. You weren't as a judge. So you and Drac weren't out of long swords again. Not yet. I might see if you'll take the swords with, me, uh, with us to Canada and we can use them there. Also, I have to say, for Mother's Day, I may have made a strip of error because I gave my mum a new phone, which is giving her a lot of fun. Hello, Dizzy. Ah, uh, oh, hello. No, it wasn't Drac. Neither of us have... Um, uh, and neither of us have lost our mums. As, as I said, it was an old friend. <sighs> but he's had a good day. And was still alive. But again, hand beats head. But I'll, as it's the day it is, I'll let him claim it's a, shit, it's a joint win. I don't know. How's Santa Canero? Hello, questions. Have you heard of Buddy the Cat? I sent you PM on Discord about him. Yes, you did. And I have heard thanks to you telling me about Buddy the Cat. <laughs> That's what I meant. Uh, I, I'm doing, I'm probably going to look into it more. Um, Vision, no encountering Headley Lamar working on Torpedo Guys and Drink Walk to and from Headley. No. Andrew Paul, what was Norfolk's condition in 95-5? Was she too worn out to be retained for a few years, considering some of the early counties were? Uh, to connect that, had the 9.2-inch heavy cruisers been um, built, would they have been used post-World War II? If the 9.2s had been built during the war, they would have probably retained. In fact, the odds are if you got 9.2s, you retained those instead of the towns and towns, counties and vanguard probably all go and the Royal Navy retains the 9.2s for a good few years, uh, which could lead to something slightly larger and much more prettier than Tiger being in existence. But we'll, we'll Tiger and Lion and Blake, we'll leave that to one side. Um, no, sir, what was the US in the reaction to Nerods? As I've read, Congress transcripts, where they were expected them to be a super hood or two more hood-like ships. Um, mostly in the case of O Sugar. But... Also, because what the British had done was built something just fast enough to be fast enough than most of the US battle line, and more powerful in terms of armour, and it had significant firepower capabilities uh, that they were sort of going, oh, that's what the Brits had done. Uh, it would have been, it, it was a case of, well, we can't build anything, so we can't react. But I would argue, in many ways, the Americans' later fast battleships are, to an extent, a reaction to what they perceived the Japanese would likely build in reaction to the Nelrods. So anyway, what if during Britain's two-power stand, another industrial nation from, let's say, South America, Brazil develops the industrial space, also announces a two-power standard, specific, especially specifically to Britain. Uh, Britain probably goes... This is going to be interesting. 
basically an infinite building run. If you because Britain's will be any two the, the next two largest powers combined. So if Brazil is specifically building to match Britain and the next largest power, at a certain point, Brazil could end up matching itself. Because it could become the second largest power, in which case it get could get very, very confusing. So yeah. O five sixteen. Instead of detaching third battle cruiser squadron for training, they send first due to Tiger's gunnery. Thus, at Jutland, the cat swaps face to the eyes, which makes them probably more survivable. And BT moves his flag to the QE as it uh, and is uh, and is in the van. Well, Queen Elizabeth herself is in a round. She's off. Is she in refit or is she in? She's in refit post Dardanelles, I think, at that point. Um. I'm just going to finish the milk and then I'll get the iron brew out. Mm -hmm. <sighs> brew chips. Iron brew. Don't worry. This is the open bottle, but I do have an unopened bottle as well. In fact, two or three unopened bottles. Um, let's see. If BT's in the Queen Elizabeth's and they're in the van, oh, well, the run to the south certainly gets more interesting. The run to the north gets very interesting. Um, I'm not sure what happens to the eyes during the run to the north, but it could well mean that the... Let's put it this way. Uh, what most likely you're talking about happens is that the Queen of the Squadron, the 15 inch guns, uh, gun, but super battle dreadnoughts are stay far more closer together and far more organized as part of the fight. So they probably end up smashing quite a bit of the battle cruiser force. The eyes, if they get caught in any way, shape, or form in Jutland, are not going to do well. They're just not designed to be. In fact, if any battle cruiser is definitely not designed to be anywhere near combat, it's an I class. Um, but no, it would be. Let's put it this way. The first scouting group would have a bloody nose at some point during Jutland. And that might actually, that might, depending on how they, the Germans react to that, how Shia reacts to the news, will impact on how the war, or how the battle plays out. Because if you see, whilst the, for the Germans, getting the Queen Elizabeth on their own, is it would be kind of like a dream. But it's a dream which is going to take a lot of pain. And the thing is, the only ships they've got that can catch them are the battle cruisers. And the battle cruisers will be shredded by them. Basically, the only hope for the battle cruisers is they get within torpedo range. So the whole thing is the Germans to catch the Queen. The Germans want to catch a significant element of the British force in a way where it can't be supported by the rest of the ground fleet and can't be amassed. So they want to outnumber their opponents. The, if you've got a battle cruiser, if you've got the first scouting group versus the Queen Elizabeth's fifth battle squadron, there isn't going to be much chance of first scouting group to actually make that pay and make that work for them. Because they're facing the force which has possibly the, has the best equipment Longest range, most powerful guns really there at Jutland. And 
more importantly than all that, has is probably the best trained crews at Jutland in term other outside of Iron Duke. So yeah, um, the odds are the scouting group gets a bloody nose. The odds are when the rest of the High Seas Fleet comes over the horizon, they still have to withdraw to the north. Potentially, because you'd have Thomas integrated into the group. So Thomas would be the squadron commander, but um, BT would have his flag in one of the Queen Elizabeth class vessels in the group, possibly Warspite. Um, the odds are that you have far more communication going backwards and forwards to Jellico because it's integrated in, and BT would have to integrate himself into the 5th Battle Squadron. Rather than treating them as an adjunct to his force, he'd have to integrate with the force, because he'd be using them. But there again, it's going to sound strange, Jellicoe might not be keen on that idea, because Jellicoe might have the theory that if BT gets hold of 5th Battle Squadron in that sort of way, he'll never let them go. Hmm. Good luck, Bijan. To himself, if Queen Mary survives and animal, uh, animals are not re uh, redesigned, how does this work? Oh, that gets completely... If Queen Mary survives... I think whatever happens, the animals will be redesigned. Um, this is the point. Animals are redesigned based on Jutland experience. And most of that experience doesn't come from the ships which were sunk. Most of that experience comes from the ships which were damaged and the studies that are those damaged. So the thing is, if Queen Mary survives, the odds are she's had damage. So the odds are that that will make her that will feed more information into the redesign of the hoods of the Admiral class. Um, Paul Amos, hello. Question: What books do you think are the best from visual directors of the twentieth British twentieth uh, uh, century British Navy ships? Please. Um, There are some pretty good books, but there is a one series which I really do enjoy. And I have the entirety of them. Oh, and you made me get up. That hurt. That hurt. Ow. That was the youngest I used to be. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm slowly getting back to fitness. Slowly. So, uh, this series. Warship Camouflage of World War II. Um, by Malcolm Wright. Really cool. Excellent content. And worthwhile looking at. You always have to remember, and I do always say this when you're looking at camouflage books, you do have to take them with a little bit of a grain of salt because they're trying their best to give you a artistic impression of what the going on fire was like, and they do it as close as they can. Is it going to be 100% perfect? No. Because the canvas that they, people were painting on was the ship. And when they were painting on the ship, there were, all, there were loads of sailors doing it. And do you imagine their sailors were so committed to the paint scheme that they would follow the exact rules, or they'd paint it just as they felt like it, to an extent? To an extent, as they felt like it. Um. Hmm. Go on, Smith. There is a good place near uh, Smith and Weston, not so much. Yes, Smith and Weston is excellent on Box Hill, and they have a jail cell that you can hold events in. <laughs> I may or may not have had birthday parties at a disturbingly old age in there. <laughs> um, Chris Ryan, how much uh, how how much changes if the London Treaty and restra uh, restrains destroy a time of general armament? Must not impose a total time limit. Hordes of tribals and French ship destroyers? Oh yeah. In which case the RM would go nuts on their larger fleet destroyers. If they don't if they are only limited, let's say you cannot build more than two of these ships to more than two thousand tons, uh, but you can build as many as you like, then the Royal Navy probably starts churning out destroyers by the nth degree uh, to as many as they can. 
poor Japan probably suddenly goes, yeah. The Fletcher Horde starts early. Um, Steam Richards, the fringe automatic on Tiger has built. Uh, would they have been viable by a system in 1982 Falklands? They'd been useful, yes. Especially in the San Carlos Bay. That's it. So the yeah, shot themselves in the foot three times. Hood, Nelson, Romney. All better than, uh, obviously, uh, and they're obviously standard series uh, battleships. Mm, pretty much. But they're supposed to be. They're all newer than most of the standard series. If they weren't better, you, the Royal Navy would be asking questions of their constructors. Hello, Ian Winter. Nice to on. If flying class had been built, would they have all been built to the 1938 design, or would the first pair be 1938 pair lines, and second pair be 1942 lines, the last two being 1944 lines? If you're changing designs, probably. And honestly, there probably will be batch built in pairs. No, so what is in the van? In the van? You have to give me context on that one. Anti report, although usually that means inside a vehicle of some kind. Uh, Anti report, yeah, well, if Brazil decided to create two best centers, the British may consider expanding the empire a bit more in South America. Um, probably not. Probably the British just start recalling their loans. <laughs> That's more likely. And also, there, there is probably going to be America having a panic attack as well. Let's be honest. If Brazil creates a two-power standard, America will be having a panic attack because America likes being the predominant, uh, predominant power in the Americas. So if Brazil suddenly challenges that, America is going to be having a fit. And, um, you know, just, the Royal Navy, the British might just sit there and watch it just go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gloria was sick in a van on Monday. Ooh. Yeah. In the Vanguard. John Byron. Uh, probably Vanguard, yeah. I might as well talk Vanguard. So anyway, how far would Britain push the building race before trying to negotiate something with the Empire of Brazil? Um, honestly, it... it this is going to sound terrible, but Brazil's population in that period and their financial stability, even if they have managed to build up the industry to build, actually build battleships to a two bass and have it, then the British probably build up as happily as they can get. But also, you have to remember there is an advantage for Brazil and advantage for Britain that Germany and Britain does not have. Germany and Britain are the other side, are either side of the North Sea from each other. Brazil and Britain are other ends of the Atlantic. One group is the next door neighbours, the other is a couple of streets over. If you've got sort of something that annoys you a couple of streets over, you can ignore it to an extent. Match it, but you don't have to you don't worry about it so much. If it's your next door neighbour who's upsetting you, that's something you will never ignore and you will vent about. Anyway, any reason that once the 35,000 ton limit limit was no longer in place, could later KG5 had a twin replace with a quad? Um, theoretically, they've had to redesign the hull, though, because after I designed it to support the twin, but they could have gone to the quad, which would be originally what they wanted, and trust me, 12, 14 inch would have been a pretty cool system to have. That would have scared a fair number of people. In the vanguard, a leading element, yeah. In the van, in front. Well, that's the context. This is why I shouldn't answer questions when I'm uh, when I'm still uh, uh, recovering from <laughs> and not had enough iron brew yet. <laughs> recovering from my like, <laughs> oh, seriously, there are hills in Headley. I have to run down and up them. I was carrying 40 kilograms, 20 weight, and 20 in my backpack, and 2 litres of water, plus 2 chocolate bars. I don't know.
Alfred BB28. Uh, speaking of wine, Washington, London, naval treaties, what would the effect have been if they had limited everyone to a certain number of ships, but no limit on said ships, tonnage, or guns? <laughs> uh, no limit on said ships' tonnage or their guns. Well, you, you real, the Royal Navy's plans for the MN3 sort of battleships with the 18 inch guns would come into existence. As would the next generation after they've, after they've completed the infrastructure upgrades they're planning. Um, by Sam Russell, the bad gunnery training of BT's battlecruisers in confined waters is legendary. But where did the High Seas Fleet train its gunnery crews? In the Baltic. I summoned. Good luck with replacing a brake line. John Farrow, how would Bismarck be if longer, other than possibly faster? Uh, more neurotic? Honestly, that's all. The Bismarck design is just... Mm. If you make it any bigger, the thing is that uh, it, the bigger you make Bismarck, and this is what I think, this is why I think Sharnos and Eisenhower work out so well, they're the sweet spot. They're big enough they can absorb all the weirdness which makes the pa uh, the Panzer sheep of the Deutschland class just wrong. But they're not so big, you can start going, I'm going to add in an idea. I have an idea. I have a cunning plan. Because it's really what happens to Bismarck and Turbot. So the bigger they are, just think the more random stuff they get. I mean, probably at some point if they get big enough, they get a flamethrower added on for no particular reason. Seriously, look at the weapons list for what not only what they fitted, but what they were considering at certain points fitting to Bismarck and Turbot. And it's basically like, well, you could honestly go with an industrial list of what weapons does Germany produce, and it's a copy-paste almost. We produce all these weapons, they'll all be fitted to our battleships. Every single one. So, okay, in this scenario, Brazil industrialized when it becomes an empire. I'm glad it does. Um, in the scenario, as said, when it's... Britain's not going to... Uh, let's put it this way. Brazil announcing that they are going to match Britain. Britain will first build. And then you will probably actually... The interesting thing is what would happen to the Falklands and the various Caribbean bases. Because I think they would get reinforced and strengthened. So you could see a lot more stuff put into them. But probably Britain just keeps building and just goes, hmm. How much can you build, Brazil? We can probably build more. Would there be a war between Britain and Brazil over that one? Um, probably no, because probably the Brazilian economy collapses first. Also, don't back, uh, don't doubt the potential idea of Britain basically bribing Brazil's neighbours to declare war on them. There it is all as our friends Chile, occasionally Bolivia, and a few others who we have good relations with. And as said, there's also the Americans, because the Americans like being the dominant power in the Americas. And if Brazil is getting that big and that capable, then America's going to have its nose put out of joint. Graham Hammer, I'm presuming this refers to the BT in the fifth ground, F fifth squadron. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth, um, would she have possibly bottled it and run so no judgment? Maybe he thinks he runs into ground fleet. Potentially. He might well interpret the 5th fleet, the 5th squadron being in front, then being the far squadron of the grand fleet, and think that he's run into the grand fleet and missed the battle cruisers, and the battle cruisers are behind him. Schumach, what do you think of Admiral Vilno? Do you think that his decision to sail was more about the self-interest or belief that he was the best person in the job? So if he was, if his replacement was going to do what Napoleon wanted, then he might as well do it. I think pretty much it's a combination of of all those things. It's a combination of he thinks he's the best person for the job that is successful to do what Vilno, what Napoleon wants him to do, and frankly, the only chance he's got to redeem his career and protect himself is actually to do it. So he's got to do it. Alan Mac Evans, 
Um, following from I'm Jerry Paul, following France's capitulation in 1940, how did the larger French destroyers, say to 12 of them, sell to Britain's ports? Can you find how would they be used? Mm. Um, they would probably be doing starting off with escort duty, which most got most destroyers ended up doing at certain points, but probably they'd find themselves being used in the Mediterranean and occasionally sailing under close enough to French colors so that the Italians and uh, uh, the Germans had to be careful about what they were hitting. But as Darius Rosky built, they'd be using convoys like Polish ships. And for post Navy, uh, post World War II, this would give the French a lot of heroes. Trust me, that every single officer on those ships, especially their commanding officers, but whoever was in charge of them, would be lionized in the French part of popular history. They'd be the, I don't know, the 12 gods of the, of the Navy. There'd be every single ship that's been built since there, since World War II would be named after one of them. That's wrong. If Queen Mary survives and Admirals are misunderstood, how do they solve the overweight issues that plagued Hood right up to her destruction? Well, they don't, because part of the reasons they... Uh, uh, they they have the overweight issues of the fact they kept modifying the design. The only way you don't have hood overweight is if you have no Jutland at all, and hood, the Admiral class get built as designed so they don't get modified and played around with so much. That's what that, that that's the reality. Pete Dawson, I can see books. There are lots of books. I even have some new books, which I was planning to go through today, but I don't think it will be because, well, that would require me moving a lot more. Hence, I'm doing the question ones. So, anyway, how realistic about all ship paint schemes? I'm talking premium paint schemes. Um, there is something to them. I'd say they try as good as they can. Wouldn't their range be such an impediment to our convoy escorts? Also, I have a feeling their size and armament can make them well suited elsewhere. They're frankly everything is doing convoy roles. In uh, Andrew Paul, that that's the thing is the Royal Navy in 1940 to 41, and then really to 1942 can't be really picky about which ships do what. It's a case of it's occasionally picky in terms of if there's a, a very scary mission going on, you'll find a tribal class destroyer doing it. But other than that, they're pretty much going, right then, we have destroyers, we have convoys, go. And there's the East Coast and West Coast, con and the East Coast convoys for the Rotten for Britain. There's, the, as I said, the Mediterranean. Mediterranean is probably where they end up most of the time. Hello, Gorn, sir. BT having his flag in War Spider Jutland, as if she needs more battle honors. Well, she's already got Jutland, so that wouldn't really change much. Other than, hang on, does the Royal Navy still do that? I don't think the Royal Navy still does the thing of special honors if they're a flagship at a battle. So, anyway, I still want a Trotinocon in my little pony paint scheme. I may or not may not be commissioning something with my first paycheck. That sounds cool, and I want pictures. Hello, Michael Patton. Colin Cameron. Doc, with the UK leaning heavily on fishing trawlers to mine to, which was best dealing with magnetic spines, a de, a, a, a de Gaust or wooden hull? Well, if you're talking to the scientists and the engineers, they'd go with a de Gaust hull, of course, you know, because that's the most advanced and gives you the best hull properties and performance. Talking to the trawlmen, they quite like the wooden hulls. <laughs> they didn't need to remember if it'd been de it, it had the galsing gear or had been degaussed. And I was like the god the goat. Not up. 1936 to get a battleship quicker than uh, the RN make uh, have uh, make a proto vanguard with spare 15 inch turrets 
on a modified KGV hull instead of the historically modified Lion. Okay. Is there a question or is that just a dream? Because that either would work for me. Honestly, if, here is something actually you could do. And this is something which was, someone was talking to me was going, well, they have the templates and the turrets and the models and everything to put to one side for more Nelson and Rodney turrets. So if they'd been starting in 1936, they could have churned out a 16 inch version of a um, fast battleship based on a KGV hull with nine 16 inch guns if they wanted to forward and in a sort of a renowned style, which would have been interesting if they'd actually put the uh, put money and effort into it. Could have been good to have some upgraded 16 inch guns built. Jack yeah, great, good super rules of support with the two power standard. In real life, no, but I'm presuming in this industrialized of Brazil, Brazil has found something which magically underpins it, so maybe they found a gold mine, literally a gold mine. Nice secret. And why did all the Washington Naval Treaty uh, signatures lie about their tonnage? I'm sorry, Doc, but misstating tonnage is still lying. As so I checked all of them, and the tonnage is stated except for two, uh, two Wyoming, Wyoming were all lies. <laughs> it's creative accounting. It's creative accounting. And in many ways, they're lying about them to... How do I put this? Uh, where it's beneficial to... If they think they're going to have to modify the ships, then you put in, you've got more... So they, they they weigh more than they do, so that then you've got spare room to modify them if you need to. That's what they're after. Two dozen. A liter of water weighs a single kilogram, so two liters of water is just two kilograms. True, but in the nicest way, that was two liters extra, two kilograms extra in a twenty uh, in a um, backpack which is already carrying twenty kilograms, and a vape vest that's carrying twenty kilograms. So yeah, I'll take it as forty-two kilograms. Possibly add in the chocolate bars, forty-two and a half. They're big bars of chocolate. And that's before you get on to all the other things I was going. Ah, uh, Tanavilla. Like there is, off the top of your head, how much did it cost for War Spike to be modernized in the 30s? Well, that's an interesting question. If I remember correctly, and I know you said off the top of my head, but if I actually have notes here, so that's what I'm going for. Um, she was uh, between 1934 and 1947. She was reconstructed at a cost of 2.363 million. Now, the reason I have this up here, and I, I, I do have notes, is because her reconstruction cost of 2.363 million is almost as much as she cost to build. She cost 2.524 million to build. It's a nice thing to think about, that the ship almost cost as much to reconstruct as she did to build. I was trying to go, what would happen if, if instead of Bismarck, Journey managed to build a Yamoto-class vessel under license from Japan? Um, Britain would have a panic attack, and I can tell you one reason for this. 
Okay, Japan could build the Yamato class and hide it to an extent from American Britain. American Britain knew it was being built, but they didn't know the details of it. Germany has no chance of doing that with Bismarck and Tirpitz. Britain knows exactly where they've been laid down. Britain's watching it the whole time. They've got more spies there than you can shake a stick at. Um, it's basically constant surveillance. The, the whole thing is, if, if they see Germany's building a battleship with 18-inch guns, at the very least, you get a completed Lion class with 16-inch guns. You possibly get a variant of Vanguard instead of turning out as she is with 15-inch guns being rapidly built, could well turn out to something which has, I don't know, twin 18-inch guns, which magically appear from the British, oh, we have these in the archives, um, design scenario. Uh, the thing is, Britain will not let that be built without them answering it. It's it nice, as I've often said, if Japan had admitted they had the Yamotos in 1941, the odds are the Americans have a panic attack because their standard ships are then are completely outclassed. Uh, there's a difference. There's a level of risk you take in wartime and there's a level of risk you take pre-war. And pre-war, the idea of going into battle with those things when they have 18-inch guns, when your ships are quite so interesting, is probably going to cause the Americans to rethink their deployments and maybe even pull the battleships. Not, I'm not saying the whole fleet, but the battleships back from Hawaii. The aircraft carriers probably still end up get there, and they still base the forward elements, which is what they'd originally based at Hawaii, and they could support at Hawaii, but the battleships might well get withdrawn from Hawaii back to the um, west coast. Either way, it would have caused Britain and America to have a panic and build ships. This is the, this is the thing, is if you suddenly see something has 18-inch guns and is coming for you, and it's, it, you're technically a piece of them. You're going to build ships. And Britain could justify building a battleship because, well, we've got Bismarck, etc. If Germany's building an 18-inch battleship, the odds are both Britain and both uh, both Britain and America panic and start building ships. I have with lots of 16-inch guns because that could be the other thing the British could go because the British could look at it and go, right, and it's got how many... 18 inch guns Ooh, let's see how many 18 inch guns eight brain engage uh yeah it's got nine 18 inch guns all right so to be able to match in with that we need something which has either nine 18 inch guns or 12. 16-inch guns, broadly speaking. So you could well see a super line with 12 16-inch guns get launched. Hello, Paul Berswick. Um, so no, no, I'm talking, um, Brazil industrialized in the same time as Britain is. Britain, Brazil first builds normal industry, the Amazon industry becomes a rival time in terms of shipbuilding by the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, then you have problems, but it could be interesting. It could end up being the BBs take over the world and end up jointly taking America apart. That could be it, but... I think the Brazil's main problem is not going to be Britain. Brazil's main problem will be America. Especially the ego of America in that period. So, post-Civil War, America is... Um, is an interesting... Play. It's going to be interesting for Brazil to deal with. Mm-hmm. I think Bismarck is pre not design Air Force trying to build a fast battleship. I think I've said that before. <laughs> I think, did I say that in... 
Didn't I say that in Friday's video? I think I put that in Friday's video. There is a lot of pre-dreadnought. There is a lot of pre-dreadnought ethos in the German Navy that is built in World War Two. Can, what can the RN get as if they've been honest with the weight of the free King George V Super Dreads and Thunder, which gives them 99, 7,000 tons to play with? Um, that would be an interesting question. What can they get? Could they get another Nelson and Rob? Mate? No, no, Rob. That'd be nice. As I've said before, the more of the new ships you build, the more interesting they get. Because there's the, as, as I said before, there's the one ship is a white elephant. Two is a capability, but it's a capability you have to be very careful of because you're one ship away from having a white elephant. Three is a capability which is always available. Four is a capability which is always at sea. Five is a capability which is survivable because you have to lose a lot of ships before you end up becoming a white elephant. Six, that's utility capability. Once you get more of that, you start building up. So, and also you have to consider how many places are you need in that capability at the same time. And that can also impact things. So, having uh, the more tons you have to build new ships, the more you get in terms of that capability. You might go, well, you know, with, with the 16 inch guns on a big capability, yes. All forward are great. Yeah, that allows the most efficient design, but um, we might reduce the armor down a smidge, smidge, and up the speed a smidge. Probably would go with a free shaft configuration, which is not something that uh, I know the British don't like a free shaft configuration, but they do it in their carriers and they do it in other things when they have to because of displacements and uh, weight limitations. So yeah, they go with a free shaft, uh, free shaft grouping, and would probably end up with. Something which could go a little bit faster. Uh, 28 knots is what they'd be aiming for. Probably not much sort of different displacement. Um, if they have 90-odd thousand tons to play with, 90, um, and the stuff they get given, they can probably... They could probably churn out Three at, at least two, possibly three more nail rods than that tonnage. If that's the case, Alpha B228, how much could treaty ship go over the prescribed tonnage before it's considered to be cheating? I know it's which it was 599 tons over 10,000 ton limit. As a rule, it was give or take 10%. Kind of like we do with essays, give or take 10%. <laughs> Alpha B228, how much difference would they have not been sunk? How much difference would they have not been, uh, they made in Southeast Asia? Well, if the Japanese hadn't had the luck to find them when they did, it's not so much that those ships make so much of a difference in of themselves, but they have Admiral Tom Phillips. Who is an experienced? Who is a quite capable admiral? Uh, I'm not 100% keen on him, but he's not as bad as he's made out of being. And so the whole thing of ABDA command, well, they form up around him. So instead of you having a poor Dutch admiral who has a very limited staff and is trying to pull everyone together around small ships, you have everything being built in together around. Repulse and Prince of Wales. You also have the odds are that with those ships there, you're going to start shoveling ships out towards them. Now, this might seem strange, but if you're forming up another fleet to take over a position, that takes longer than if you have a fleet there you're reinforcing. Because if you're reinforcing, those ships are running to something to reinforce. So you might end up with an aircraft carrier managing to make it out there quite quickly, etc. Or things being sent. That could give them a bit more of a viability. How does it affect things? Well, it depends how the Japanese respond, which also depends on what the Americans are up to. If the Americans are as active as they were traditionally, then probably not much. The Japanese form up, 
come down and smash with everything. Basically do a full Hulk smash. But if the Americans decide that, hang on, the Brits are blocking them, and if we send our shuttle, our equipment, our ships over to them as well, and ABDA command becomes a multinational fleet which is actually strong, maybe it gets a British carrier, maybe an American carrier as well, and all those things added into it, then it could become a significant roadblock to Japanese maneuvers and could actually give MacArthur time to, I don't know, wake up, remember he's a general, not a movie star, and actually organize things. Or just find someone who can organize the things and then take credit for it. I don't really mind which way he does. The latter is probably the most sensible one. Um, the guys, guys work. They put twenty times one hundred thirty-eight millimeter. Uh, hundred. Oh, no, the twenty times one thirty-eight B millimeter flak thirty A as AK triple A Dado flat flames. The latter having twenty times eighty millimeter cannons. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. So anyway, in the treaty, there is a typo, and limit for battleships is now 350,000 tons. Woohoo! <laughs> you do not want to see how big that battleship begets. A 350,000 ton battleship. Oh, we could have fun with that. Have a look. could have a lot of fun with 350,000 tons. Sorry, I can hear something floppy running around outside my door. Hello. To what do I owe to pleasure? Oh, you want a biscuit, do you? Alright. Hello, there's a boxer. Um, yeah, 350k. Uh, you're talking, I don't know, 12, 15, 18 inch guns? <laughs> 350,000 tons. I can build a very large ship. Modern air, the modern US aircraft carriers are only 107,000 tons. So think about something the size and scale of that. But with massive guns. I might even get the 20 inch guns built. Um, uh, the H89. Were there actually any plans for Germany to give the IGN the plant designs for the Shan Horse? I. I know Battleship New Jersey mentioned the US fought them. Well, that's because um, the Americans did like to believe that the Japanese needed the Germans' help to build any decent ships. I myself think that the Japanese, if they got the plans for the Shan Horse, would have found them the source of endless comedy. Uh, as much as I'm a fan of the Shan Horse, I do consider them possibly the best of the larger ship designs that the uh, German Navy actually does build. Um, I know that might seem strange, but they are certainly the best of them. Um, I would not, under any circumstance, think that the Japanese couldn't build a lot better. With their eyes closed, hands tied behind their back, and while singing the, uh, singing the Okie Koki. Um... And if, that, if you don't know what the Okie Koki is, look it up. But, um, yeah, the, the Japanese would have had a good laugh. That's what you know. The battle almost will be for the war spike be surviving BT. Ah, oh, war spike managed to survive BT on many occasions. And did it, did it? Oh, there's a Poxo, John South. Well, what, what, what. Oh, there's a Poxo. A uh, bit weird. Did you know if the Chinese Grand Canals had any effect on the Iron Cloud pre general era? How could they have used the Grand Canals versus the Japanese to give their fleet an advantage? They could have used them for moving their fleet, but traditionally the Grand Canals were more often used by the Royal Navy in the Age of Sail, turning up with a first or second rate to blow the bejesus out of a city. Um, that's basically the how what she wrote for the Opium Wars. Uh, the the Grand Canals, unfortunately, to, for them to be used properly, the the Grand Canals would have had to have the the, the Chinese would have had to have a decent navy, and the Chinese never really seemed to build a decent navy. You want to go back to your mommy? Okay. You're going to say hello to everyone first. All right. Mm -hmm. Go on. 
I'll let you go back to your mummy. Nope, no, they've closed the door on you. I think they've sent you down here with me for the evening. Were you annoying them that much? In. Come on. I'll give you a biscuit. Go on, big bluff. Vicky, come. Vicky, come. Any come. Because I have got a fluffy research assistant for the evening now. I know, I know. I keep my word. Um. See, Richard, could Tiger or Blake, uh, or both, as built, deal the Belgrano? Well, they could both deal the Belgrano. They'd be newer ships than the Belgrano. Um, they've got also loading six inches, six inch guns. Uh, theoretically, if they work and their rate of fire keeps up. I mean, just, sorry, a piece of thing has just dropped on the floor. I'll give you the biscuit, which is the important thing, and that'll keep you amused. And then I'll go hunting for the, ca uh, the cable which is dropped on the floor before you try and eat it. You might claim you won't try and eat it, but I know you. Everyone thinks because you're a poodle you don't eat anything, when actually you are a stomach on legs. Given half the chance, you'd eat me. There we go. Uh, so here, did the King George V get Vickers 14 inch, or did the British government do a bit of trolling and design a custom one and not let it be produced by Vickers? No, they got the Vickers 14 inch. Um, a version of Vickers 14 inch. Paul Amos, does the similarity between the building cost and roof of the wall spike take into account the buying power of a pound? Pretty much. That's the reality. Inflation and various other things have got involved, and that's why the cost is almost as much to upgrade her as it, it, it costs to build her in the first place. Rubisava, when the Royal Navy ships were repaired or upgraded in American yards, did the US fabricate the Royal Navy specific parts or were they shipped from Britain? Um, and also, did Britain have to pay during World War II? Um, prior to Lend Lease, Britain had to pay. Uh, the part, Some parts were shipped from the UK on board the ship which actually took them and needed them. Uh, I think that was what Rodney was doing before she got involved with sinking the Bismarck. Um, from memory, and um, yeah, the some the Americans produced, and some they just put in American parts, and then found out that the British and the American definition of various things was different. Uh, the Imperial Gallon versus the U.S. Gallon were different. The Imperial measures of pressure versus the U.S. measures of pressure turned out to be. Not that dissimilar, but they're similar enough to cause issues. Uh, and there were also issues with terms of measuring of voltage, etc. It was it was an interesting time getting the ships to work together, let's put it this way. Um, Graham Handler, could the Yamato or Mashashi get through the Kiel Canal? <laughs> um, oh. For that, I have to look up the dimensions of the Kiel Canal, because it's not the width I'm worried about. It's the, um, depth. Uh, da -da 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 -da. It's a da -da -da. it's a freshwater canal. I'm so nostalgic. Holstein. What did that? It, its maximum draft it allows is nine and a half meters, and the draft 
of the ammo to his 10.4. So no, nope, it wouldn't fit. Uh, boat beam maximum is um, 32 and a half meters in theory. In practice, though, I think they could fit. I just don't think there would actually be traffic going any other direction. Anyway, hang on, they might be having trouble with the locks. How many locks are there on the Kiel Canal? I don't think there are. They'd have to do some building work. Let's put it this way. There are some building issues that they would have to deal with. Um, but I think they could just... Uh, I, I, the thing is the, is, the, is the depth. The depth would stop it because they'd have to be lightened considerably to get through. They are too long, too fat, and too deep in draft, theoretically. But I think the only one which isn't able to really be worked around is the de is the draft. They'd have to do some mahusive work on terms of dredging. Nice hearing. What's two thousand ton destroyer HMS Swift? Much easier and other than experience to operate larger destroyers. Um. Mm, there's the experience that she'd have been more useful it was felt if she'd been part of a class they could have used her more as a destroyer class because trouble is with one-off destroyers when they're larger is they stick out and i was quite sure they're a destroyer destroyer leader and what they're doing alfred b228 if the us finds out about yamoto's 18 inch guns and decides to respond i have an image in my head of a battleship with 15 16 uh guns with uh with a brooklyn style turret out that's always an option. That is always an option. Now, the RN of 1945 can build a fleet to refight Jutland. No carriers allowed. What would they build and how would it go and who would it command? They have to refight Jutland. Um, honestly, they probably build a fleet of... For Jutland, they probably build a fleet of vanguards. That's what you need. Just standardize and just churn out a huge amount of vanguards. Uh, tribal class destroyers to what? Uh, or well, battle class destroyers actually, with all the torpedoes and the gun, the four point five inch guns, and uh, that would wipe out most of the cruisers and destroyer elements of the fleet, enemy fleet, and probably some of the six inch cruisers. Um, but honestly, the tiger class, if they could get them to build with the auto six inches, so they just churn out those as well. That will what they would to go back to the refi Jutland. Vanguards, Tigers, and Battles in 1945. Uh, Paul going. if you were to introduce a Hawkins to a large yacht, uh, rock, what year would be best to prep for World War I, World War II? What would you replace them with? Uh, the best year would be about 19... 32, 30, 32-ish. So you can continue on the county construction. I hope they get something decent. Um, just introduce them all to large rocks. Hello, Hakan Vagel. Vagel? Vagel? Uh, sorry. Uh, good evening, look. Fun fact. Cat in my laps are awful. Oh, <laughs> yeah. As far as the Americans are spooked by Hood and the Finnish Lexington and Saratoga as battle cruisers in the place of the Colorados. What effect does this have on the US Navy's treaties in World War II? The Colorados get converted instead? No, the other Lexingtons would get converted. You, no one would want to try and convert a Colorado to a carrier. Um, no. So if they finish off Lexington and Saratoga, then it's the next two get converted. And then the Americans end up with quite an interesting fast battle group based around two task forces based around a battle cruiser and a fast battle a, a carrier based a, a battle cruiser converted to a carrier. Honestly, that'd be a pretty good ta task force, and it might be something which causes the Royal Navy to have a panic attack because that would be a very interesting force to try and deal with. Is that 350,000 tons for one ship or 350,000 tons for battleships? No, 350,000 tons for one ship. What's how I read it? 
Down here, just walking home from the Mother's Day lunch. 350,000 tons for a battleship? High Crete? Oh, just imagine it. It'd be... The, 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 the arm would be that thick. Multi layer plates. Can't go somewhere uh, not that Bismarck had that much 20 minutes. It's just the 20 minute flak ammo are not good for 20 minute float plan count. No, this is the other problem with the Bismarck design is you have so many guns and the guns can't interact or share stuff at all. This is why you pair down because then you don't carry much ammunition per gun. And what you need on your ship is ammunition per gun. Uh, for those who don't realise, it's Mother's Day in the UK today. It's not Mother's Day in America, it's Mother's Day in the UK. Juicy, the American, English, and Japanese could build a 150,000 ton ship between them. England can't Monday, Wednesday. US gets a first of Friday, and Japan gets for Sundays. Ah, uh, no. Britain would never let, never let the Americans drive it. They're far too, they're far too careless. Chris Ryan, something remembers the brew. Good times. Want to see the corgi? The training assistant, floppy resistant, resistant is tired. Uh, he ha he he may have. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. Uh, you know, I said I had a backpack with twenty kilograms of weight on me. That might have been four kilograms of actual weight and sixteen kilograms of corgi on my back. May or may not have been. Poodles do not consider being carried around for the entire walk to be a good thing. Corgi considers it amazing. Get so much fuss on tension. I got so the fluffy research assistant is is a disguised Labrador. The fluffy research assistant is well, he's a poodle, but he's not insane. Jack, right? Wait, is that twenty-four and uh, twenty-four and a half? Your last tubes. You're winding up there now, Jack. Uh, is that great? At least the fluff is on Blue Healer. Blue Healers are alligators on legs with bottomless stomach. Potentially. Um, that room. Swap the VLS cell between two different ships on Ultimate Monks. It's the ultimate fitted for, but not only with, sometimes with. Uh, sorry, Yamato Moshashi would have dug a new Kyo Canal. Potentially. <laughs> If models and vast buccaneers were in the Falklands War, would the Argentinian Type 42s be able to defy, uh, defy the 25th of May, defend the 25th of May against a buccaneer attack? Or is Skyhawks for the matter? Um, the thing is, the, the, the problem you have, and it's the same problem the British to an extent had with the Type 42s and the Argentinians, the British know the exact parameters and weaknesses of the Type 42. So, their electronic warfare teams on Buccaneers, which always were quite good, would probably have a lot of fun winding, uh, knocking back the T Type 42 radar to the point at which they got within missile launch range and then blast away. So that's probably the plan. In your work uh, opinion, which ironworks would have developed the 15-inch 45s? Ellswick. If in doubt, any whenever Britain goes to develop new guns, they go to Ellswick. Whoever owns Ellswick doesn't matter, they go to Ellswick. The death of the on that canal meant Bismarck had no armor for a steering. It meant all sorts of things to Bismarck, honestly. Now, can I instructions? Whilst you're also loading 600 gun working in 1945, it could have been made working in 1945. It isn't because they go slow. 
Well, they could have made it work in 1945 two innings. Uh, uh, probably actually better than they eventually got it because they'd over engineered it by the time it was actually fitted. Admirable. By some miracle, HRS Swift is not disposed of post World War One and managed to survive World War Two. Assuming the decision is now to use her convoy and our fleet as would she be renamed? If so, how? Um, probably wouldn't be renamed. Rearmed? Yes. And you are you asking rearmed at the moment? Um, probably a load of double four inch guns. A lot of double four inch guns. In over in in the mounts as they put onto the C and the D uh, C and the D class vessels with them. Let's go in which ships other than Bismarck you might interpret are overhyped. Um mm, that's an extra question. See, I have a soft spot for the Iowas. And I think because they're the last sort of big class of ships built, they do tend to get a lot of people's attention on them as they're some sort of thing which stands out on their own. But the thing is, you have to look at the other designs going around at the time, and if they'd been built, the Iowas would be definitely one of the better designs available, but they wouldn't have been quite so distinctive. But there again, I like them, so I don't really care about that as much. Um, what designs get overhyped? Dido's? Um... To an extent, any machine gun cruiser gets to an extent overhyped. <sighs> Latorios don't get enough attention. <sighs> Honestly, you've got the big three, and of those, one deserves its hype. Because it's the only 18 inch battleship I've ever built, so it might as well get hyped. It's not that amazing, but it's the only one built, so it's worthwhile talking about. Mr. Ross, if a vessel from any era or nation could be found intact, more or less, in desert, Antarctic, Arctic, Black Sea, etc., what would it be? It doesn't have to be a specific vessel name, but generic type. What would be your preference? Um, well, I'd like an age of sail ship to appear from the Arctic, or a World War Two cruiser. Um, any sort of any of the World War Two cruisers lost would be quite cool. Um, a battleship, a British battleship. Nice no, I won't say Americans because there are a lot of American ships which have been preserved. Not enough. I would. There are always more I would like to add to the list, but there are a lot there to, to stand as representatives of their sisters who've gone. Um, the the British don't have enough preserved, and I I could be generous and go a French ship or an Italian ship, but honestly, I'm patriotic and also I am re a naval is British naval historian, and I am frustrated by the lack of ships which have survived. So, I would like to find a British battleship. So, find one which was sunk at sea. So, if we could find intact and rate floating up to the surface, I don't know. Suddenly, Prince of Wales. Well, we found Prince of Wales in Repulse, but you know what I mean. If suddenly they floated up to the surface completely intact and museum ready, I wouldn't be out disappointed if one of them was there. Repulse, preferably over Prince of Wales. This was, how much of an effect did the RNS institution have on the development of the world's navies? Um, a lot of navies try to claim not much effect. Um, the reality is, though, a lot of navies uh, had the impact of the Royal Navy because the Royal Navy was, for most of the period while navies were developing, for roughly 200 years, the Royal Navy was the navy in the world, and people ape it because that's what you do when you have uh, when one navy is the, is the unassuming dominant navy in the world. It's the biggest and it's the most present, so people copy it. And it's in there indelibly. There's a reason why the uniforms around the world do look a lot like the Royal Navy uniform. And once you go beyond some places, 
There are a fair number nowadays which are more American, but that's mainly because they can buy the American uniforms quite cheap. How, Cody 85, thank you. Hi, Doc. Would a purpose-built hybrid con uh, CV merchant vessel work, and how would it be balanced? We call them Mac ships. And it's an interesting con uh, it's an interesting concept, but basically it would have worked quite well if they'd been built in numbers prior to World War II if you'd had them in service. So they could take six or so aircraft, hangar, a small hangar for maintenance, and there's probably a single lift, and they'd probably have to be what I would call bulk carriers in terms. They'd either have to be oil uh, oil tankers, which are already quite high, a high, uh, uh, focus, ship, uh, high focus ship, or grain carriers, something that carries a lot of stuff which you can easily offload and load without disrupting the flight deck. And having a lot of them in service prior to World War II would be great because you just make sure a couple were in every convoy. Would theirs be useful as dedicated escort carriers? No, but would they do the job for most of 1939, 40, and 41? Yeah, what would they do to the enemy submarines? Well, if you have 12 swordfish on your, in your group wandering around a convoy, able to operate from one of two flight decks, then they're going to cause trouble for your submarines to attack because your submarines suddenly can't spend their life on the surface, especially once they got uh, so uh, anti-submarine uh, air service radar and anything that stops the uh, Germans building up the kill experience especially in the 1941-42 and 42-43 period is going to have an impact on the losses overall suffered it's the the Battle Atlantic is an attrition war and basically the attrition is between merchant ships and escorts on one side and submarines on the other side and the advantage the British and Americans and the Allies have is that Liberty ships and Victory ships, as well as flag class corvettes, etc., are and hunt class uh, escort destroyers are quicker and easier to build and build and work up to a desired operation level than submarines. That's good. The clock. Um, hello. What would have happened if the USN, instead of producing the damnable moving um, mono wing, instead procured the glorious and divine biplane? Um, they might have developed a night flying operational capability because the only reason you would actually procure something like a swordfish, etc., at that period is if you're going for long range night flying. That's why you go with a swordfish because you just the swordfish design is the way it is, is to make it as easy to maintain, as easy to repair and easy to fly as possible because you're planning on flying at night. Y if you're planning on flying in the day, well, that's a lot easier to fly, and so you can go for a more difficult to fly aircraft and more complicated to fly aircraft. If you're planning on flying at night, mm -hmm. Soon. Well, we like to do those hypothetical scenarios for World War Two, World War II, uh, World War One, World War Two. But if you wound up as first Sea Lord in seventeen sixty, how do you reform the RN back then? The single biggest impact you could have from seventeen sixty onwards is if you professionalised the NCO Corps more. Ever over and beyond everything else. If you could professionalize the chief petty officers, etc., and can make them into a far more professionalized section, so you had NCOs, warrant officers, etc., and the officers are all gradiated in as part of the fleet and enforce, keep maintain the education standards, maintain the require, uh, ma maintain the requirements, but have the NCOs be part and sort of have a professionalized um, non commissioned officer formation and probably have some 
section which allows for Mustang officers. To use that American phrase, which I quite enjoy, i.e. the promotion of NCOs to officers uh, at some point in their, career, in their career path if they choose to go the officer route. But, yeah. Hmm. And I remember, to be fair to the uh, subs, jobs were made more difficult by Argentine trackers and seekings. Nothing else, they would serve as good dist a distraction for buck upper buccaneers. Uh, so, anyway, what would Arley Burke do if he got a lot of Arley Burke class ships? Have a party. He would be literally happier than anything. Uh, that's a fox, though. How much would an effect on. Uh, did, uh, how much of an effect did HMS Hawkins have on the cruiser development? And were they called armor cruiser initially? They were called large light cruisers initially, or Atlantic light cruisers. They were not armor cruisers. They were light cruisers, and they were suddenly designated as heavy cruisers. And this is my problem with the heavy cruiser designation, because you're mate turning a light cruiser into a heavy cruiser. Don't change. Three hundred eighty thousand ton battleship. Were how could you would you build it? And most interesting, how do you modernize this thing in 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s? Doubtful models in the 1960s or turn into CV? Okay, if I have a 350,000 ton battleship, how am I going to build it? For starters, I'm going to have to build it in a graving dock. I'm going to have to build it in a dock that I can float it out of because there is no way I am launching that thing. It will break its back. I want water to flow in and it to float up. I do not want to be having to drive it into a river. I'll never stop it. It'll build the other side and come out. Or if I'm launching in Atlantic, it will hit the other side of Atlantic. So it's a graving dock construction. Um, so probably I'm talking Harland, Wolf, or Camel Lairds, and I'm extending their graving docks, because it's going to be big. Uh modernize it in the 30s if i'm building in the 20s it depends how big i've built it but honestly the modernizing thing is going to be more aa guns and more and radar it's going to be built with a huge freaking engine suite 350,000 tons to get out to battleship speed is going to be astronomical uh four propeller four shafts you're probably dealing with a six shaft ship um, it's just gonna be big, and I mean really big. Um, but no, you 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 could do it. Uh, would it be turned into a carrier? Probably not. Would you maybe build a carrier based on a similar idea of a hull, potentially? But no, it would be a massively thick armor. And um, honestly, if the Royal Navy have that, then at some point G America, uh, Germany probably goes, why do we build a battleship? Because can we build anything like that? This works in. The SS class carrier. They are so much better because they are so much bigger and fix non-issues of previous generation. Also SX Swarm. Hmm, that's pretty much it. So anyway, the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier group, so I'm presuming you mean the battle group, i.e. Type 45 destroyers, Type 23 frigates, supply ships, Queen Elizabeth, maybe an astute class submarine, with all the F-35Bs extra board sent to the British Harbour in 1935. What happens? Uh, Britain has a party. Britain probably announces it's leaving the treaty system. Uh, because it's just got a brand new aircraft carrier. Uh, the Daring class are possibly classified, uh, are probably reclassified as cruisers. Probably the Type 23s are classified as cruisers as well. And they begin cross-examining the crew and ripping everything apart they can to try and work out how they can do it. Um... 
honestly, could we build something like Tape 45 radar in 1939 uh, after four years of studying it? Probably not. We probably were going to. We could probably, uh, with the technology and understanding of the people there, you could probably retro, uh, you could probably upgrade a few things. Uh, the on uh, Honestly, the phalanx gun springs to mind. You could build a 1930s version of that, and that would be kind of interesting. A phalanx ga uh, gatling 20 or 30 millimeter cannon. Yeah, it, 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 there's lots of interesting ideas which would go from it. By the time World War II comes around, it'll probably take two years to try and pick stuff apart and work out how to do it. Another year to try and design something. A year to start production, so it won't actually be in service till about 1940. So 1939, nothing much. By 1940, there's a lot of problems for people. Well, from Chicago. Yeah, um, Nice to How much tomorrow's how's tomorrow will Washington Air Treaty? Have you had any run-ins with uh, Wearboos or uh, past the booze? Not yet, but give them give them time. Um, Paul from Chicago. If you could do one thing for modern US fleet train, shipbuilding or maintenance infrastructure, what would you do? <laughs> um, if I was gonna do one thing for the modern US fleet train. Shipbuilding or infrastructure. <sighs> Infrastructure, I give them some more dry graving docks and I get them working because I think that's the big problem. I especially need graving docks which can take not just their carriers but all their ships. They need more of them, they need more of those facilities, and they need them more around the world. So they do need one, they probably need something which can take them and carry it in them. Oh, and why? Uh, that room, HS all day, it's just 1912, the pre-World War II King George V class that was sunk by mine October 1914 with no one aboard killed. So an oral grave, bring her up? Hmm, that'd be fun. If she, if she could be brought up, that'd be quite cool. Sure, Mac, Mac cannons in the atmosphere? Hmm. That depends. Are you meaning Mac cannons as in the sort of science fiction proposed idea or are you meaning cannons which fire you sean because you're sean mac so uh, the, uh, if it's cannons in the atmosphere which fire versions of you all over the planet probably not thank you but you know as much as i do like you i i i, I prefer there being one of you i think if there are millions of you being fired by cannon uh, you know sort of by cannon all over the planet i think that might Cause some problems. Judy Harmon in 1938. It was not until spring that the United States agreed to 16 inch rather than 18 inch gun limit. Um, Hadfield's uh, Limited of Sheffield, UK, so they could produce and needed 18 inch anti arm piercing shells in a few, very few months. Yeah. Anyway, you said the Dido is overhyped. How would a tribal class rearmed with four and a half inch guns of high evolution torpedo tube, high evolution of torpedo tube replaced by an eight barrel mm, high evolution torpedo tubes replaced by eight barrel Bofor? How would that have stood up as an AA ship? I mean, very useful as an AA ship, but why would you replace the torpedo tubes with an eight barrel Bofor? Because you already can, you can already have forty millimeters already carried. You could. Without you could replace the existing pom poms with bofors and keep your torpedo tubes, and then you'd have a you still have a kick ass destroyer to use a range, especially if you have well, honestly, you could go daring class with six 4.5 inch guns style and replace X or sort of X mount with pom with um, 40 millimeters. Or you could go tribal, have eight four and a half inch guns, uh, sort of again daring style guns. Uh, keep the torpedoes and keep the forty millimeters as standard. Then you'd just be scary. You really would be scary. Remember the whole reason that um, the battles don't have. The R four and a half, aft four and a half inch guns. It's one saving production costs and uh, 
and time two is to balance out having the 40 millimeters at the rate I got it 40 millimeter sets are. So, how different goes World War One and World War Two if their respective King George V are switched? Uh, well, if World War Two, if the if King George V from World War Two go back in time to World War One, then World War Two is going to be massively different. And by the uh, and honestly, when the King George V appear in World War Two, uh, World War Two, they'll be even more out of date. Uh, because if you have 10, 14 inch guns appearing especially prior to Jutland, with all the radar guidance they have, you probably say goodbye to the German fleet at Jutland if you've got World War II King George V for that instead. There wouldn't be anything really surviving after they finished. Which would change the sort of treaty scenario and change the length of the war, because again, if the German Navy gets wiped out, then the Royal Navy heads to the Baltic. If the Royal Navy heads to the Baltic, they're going to impose a total blockade on Germany by blocking off the Swedish trade. If they manage to block off the Swedish trade, then all the supplies from Sweden, the food, etc., it becomes a problem. Germany probably tries to invade by that point Denmark, but they've just lost their battle fleet. They, their troops are committed on the western and eastern front. Finding forces to actually invade Denmark is going to be difficult at this point. So they, Denmark is also on full alert, and unlike Norway in World War II, will resist uh, with the full force of government and everything, whereas in Norway in World War II, the government sort of paralyzed for the first 24 hours, and that gives the Germans too much time. But no... Uh, yeah, uh, basically, King George V's go back in time to World War One. There is no, World War One ends within a few weeks, possibly a few days. My introductions. Uh, well, that's an I didn't. I put up. I didn't give a time frame for that. Given that if you have the Maltas, they're likely to have E twos and Phantoms looking around the area. I'd imagine the Iron would find the Argentinian carrier first instead of the other way around and take advantage of. Bear in mind, the Iron knew they were planning an attack. Hmm. Peter Richards. Arc Royal survives the war. Does she get modernized rather than victorious? Would it be cheaper? Yes, it would be cheaper because she hasn't had quite such big armor. And would she be modernized rather than victorious? Probably because she's Arc Royal, so she's got the status. So again, victorious was a large arc chosen because of her status. No, sorry, what is the American uh, and French version of the wearable? Um I'm not sure. Uh, G.C. Jones puts uh, Burgaboo and Fromageaboo. Um... I would just usually went in the, uh, the American version with someone who going, America, America, the whole time. And you're just kind of going, yeah, I'd rarely meet those, though. I have I have met a couple in my time, but usually it's a case of, yeah, American equipment usually is fairly decent. And usually when it's not the best equipment out there, it's because it's probably the best built, uh, best to build in terms of, well, the great debate, of course, is often is the, um, Sherman tanks. And I'm quite a fan of them, despite people calling them saying they were Tommy Cookers and all the other things. The thing is, you could build them in a large number and maintain them and easily support them. So you could have a bazoodles of them. And it's useful to have bazoodles of something because you do take losses. Whereas for Germany and Britain, in terms of their tanks, when they got destroyed, it was a problem repairing them and replacing them. The British ones a lot less than Germany, but German ones massively. That's good. For all the wonderful features that the sword British has, I was talking about the Blackburn Blackburn. Oh, I was just trying to keep away keep away from the Blackburn Blackburn. If the Blackburn Blackburn was in the US Navy service, there would be a very weird US Navy for a few years.
Welcome to England. Professionalized MCA is every hoodie. You're a Jacobin. Mm, that's the biggest impact I could have. If you start prof if you give the Royal Navy a professionalized NCO call from 1750, just imagine the Royal Navy that exists by World War One. So anyway, who was in charge of discipline on age of sail um, uh, age of sail of a ship? Uh, the master at arms. Well, yeah. Who usually is pretty much, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the uh, the masters and their mates. Uh, sort of the, that's their their their, th their team. It's sort of the masters' mates. They would have things like starters and uh, <clears throat> cat and nine tails to encourage you. Somehow, what's the optimum speed for streaming paravines? Hmm. Is it nine watts? I think you're talking about nine to twelve knots, but I'm not a hundred percent sure because that's partially from memory, and the source I was looking up for doesn't have it written helpfully. Very helpfully, they don't have it written. As you all, Hulkin's class live is getting some flashbacks to um, furious, glorious, and uh, courageous there. Uh, uh, there. Mm, yeah. And Andrew Cox. Most underrated naval historical power is. Mm. Portugal and Denmark. I'd love to say China or India and be really cool because that, that that's where some of the current academia stuff seems to be heading. But no. The Indians were about had about as capable of the navies as we thought they did. Um, the Ottomans, we've always known, had a fairly decent navy at points, but China builds up a massive navy, do really quite well, then destroy it all, because that's what the Chinese do when it comes to navies. Again, they have a habit. This is one of the reasons why there's sort of, I do think there is a, a certain group of Americans currently looking at their current naval build up and going, yeah, they do this. They spend about 20 years building up a navy, then they spend about 20 years dismantling it, and then they do nothing for about another 40 years. Okay. Um, but, yeah, Denmark and Portugal. Sweden gets more attention than Denmark does, and honestly, it should be Delaware, and Denmark's navy is cool. And if you're on a 350,000 ton limit, wouldn't it be more practical to build three 116,000 ton battleships instead of one 350,000 ton ship? Um, honestly, if you're allowed to build a 350,000 ton battleship, it probably is more practical to build less. In fact, honestly, if it was me, and I was supposed to be building it, I'd be building five seventy thousand ton ships. Because with the capabilities of five seventy thousand ton ships, I can probably take out a three hundred fifty thousand ton ship. 
And I can guarantee to have two or three of them available at any one time. Just got, if the Queen Elizabeth class car uh, carrier suddenly gets in back, the British watchmakers suddenly get a lot of work making very finely engineered components. A lot of work. Hi, right, Dick Richards. Hi, Anuk. You can get four 85,000 ton super lions for 350,000 ton limit. Get a large battleship fleet for um, 350,000 ton limit. Uh, honestly, 350,000 tons is not a lot. It's not a lot in battleship terms. 525,000 tons is the limit they give for um, the Washington Treaty, which is 15 ships out of 35,000 tons of ship. I have a feeling the British are trying for 16 when they are looking at 33,800 tons. This is also, given the 19, given the 1959 British Empire across the Anglican of flanks, you would see them repeatedly try and put them on tanks. A Churchill flanks would solo the entire Luftwaffe and the <laughs> German anti-tank in North Africa. It would be interesting. It was a Halo Reach reference. Ah, Tremac. See, I thought it was, a, I, I thought, Sean, I honestly thought, it, I was halfway thinking it was Matt Cannons other than you being, Matt, uh, Cannons for you put all around the planet. Well, it could be cool to have a few man cannons You're from Halo to protect. What are you? What, what's complaining? Is there a fo is there a squirrel out there? Squirrel or fox? Which one? Be nice to the fox. He's better behaved than you are some days. She is. She doesn't nick anyone's ice cream. Um. If Bismarck and Turpitz started in 42, when would they finish? Never. They just wouldn't. The, the, the Germans would never give them the supplies to finish them. They barely managed to find the supplies to finish the submarines they tried to build. Hi, James Earth. Oh, theoretically, if they could have come to design consensus early on, could you get four to five Vanguard hulls built and have the R class left in commission to last possible moment, then bring them up in, in one at a time to swap the turret so as to minimize the amount of time the RN goes out one day 15 inch gun and single tennis to get new fast battleships quickly? Uh, theoretically, you could. If you, let's say, if you'd had a Vanguard design worked out and happy with it by 1934, and you started building them, and you built them at a pace of two a year, ordering two in 34, two in 35, and two in 36, let's say. And I'm including possibly one of the older, uh, one of the un uh, unimproved Queen Elizabeth class in this uh, uh, sort of mix-up. Um, that you're talking two years roughly build... Get them the turrets in them, so you'd be without two sh you'd be two ships down for roughly six months at a time, which you could do go about, and you could have had them in service by World War Two. It would have been treaty wise interesting, but you could have sped it up by the fact that the, the Japanese, are, are of course, leave the treaty in nineteen fifty seven. Would have made things interesting for both the Italians and the. Germans in World War Two, if the British have six vanguards instead of, because you probably end up with three based in the Mediterranean and three based in the UK. Also, at that point, you do have a question about why are we building the um, King George V? We don't one side. <laughs> W. Swordsman. Uh, if World War II King George V go back to World War I, the interesting question is how the British get the Germans to come out and get destroyed. Because they probably don't tell anyone that they've got these new king, these super King George V until, uh, because they've got similar enough names and they just put them on the list, 
as King George V class vessels and just call them King George V class vessels and don't admit they have them. Remember, they'll be based up at Scarpa Flow. The British can control the information going in and out quite well. The Germans didn't really have much of an idea. And if it comes up close, let's say as long as it's within wartime and within sort of less than 12 months before uh, Jutland, the Germans will come out. And the Germans came out a few times as well. And also you have to remember the King George V's, along with the Queen Elizabeth's, well, the King George V's are 20... I can make nine ships, aren't they? Yeah, they are um, 28 knot ships. So if you have them and the Queen Elizabeth in service with their 20, sort of their 25 knot configuration, you suddenly, you suddenly have the King George V could be up there with the. You could have a. It would be a really scary for a formation because you'd have the Queen Elizabeth, King George V, and the Big Cats would probably be turned into your hunter killer group. And honestly, again, King George V could also have radar and all sorts of other things. If if they're engaging the Germans at night, the Germans would lose their entire fleet at Jutland in a night battle. It'd be a case of clear everything out and just leave, leave the King George V in this area. Anything moves which isn't them, they'll be destroyed. They'd run out of ammunition before the Germans ran out of ships. But the ships the Germans would lose would never be re 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 rebuilt. They'd just be sitting there going, ah. What you probably have to do is you'd have to pair up a King George V with a, with a Queen Elizabeth. And they'd be in hunting groups. And each one would have a King George V and a Queen Elizabeth. And each of the hunting groups would just slowly sidle up to German battleships and wipe them out at night. <laughs> Seneca Nero, French wherever we will. Mm. Um, nice one. What's the spearfish too big for the illustrious and follow on carrier designs? <coughs> um, it was just about doable, but not really great. Oh, yes, I know. I sneeze. I do bless you. Thank you. Oh, you came to check me. Hello. When Papa sneezes, you come check me. This is something we told you to do without realizing. We sneeze, you come check. Desert Brock says, T boo, free boo, Bridget uh, Bagetta boo. Free, uh, free boos come up when they try and claim US uh, solo Joan in Japan. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to watch America try and do. Um. Come on, if instead of agreeing to end the War of 1812, it had been kept going, how long would it take the RN to... Hello. Do you want to get off of my lap? Would that be happy for you? Okay. How long would it take the RN to move sufficient forces um, to net the rise in the USA? Uh, they'd already got them out there by 1812, pretty much. Uh, they already had sufficient force out there, but if the USN had managed to somehow keep sustaining itself and uh, managed to get the funding under the government to launch some of their first rates, then you've probably seen a few more ships turn up. But they pretty much, by 1812, they had the forces in place. Oh, hello. This happy little dog is here. He, he would like to come in now. Is he? Yes, he would, because he's getting hungry. He keeps trying to eat me, and he's run he's out of happy. water. <laughs> Ah, I'm going to make it complicated for you. Yes, well, I've, yes, we've got the temporary out. I've got the fluff out. Do you want the Mayflower? Yes, I have the microphone. Is he with you? No, he's not. Oh. <laughs> 
filled up the wrong glass. I'm using the brew ship's glass and I filled up the um, iron brew glass. Oh well, don't mind. Not two months of iron brew going on. Um, Interesting. Does the observed failure rate of the Russian precision guided munitions in Ukraine indicate that they've tried and failed to keep up American shiny toys rather than the tough and cheap Soviet design policy? Um, possibly it means more that they are the tough and cheap design policy. This is the thing is they are probably fairly rugged, fairly reliable in terms of launching and actioning. Are they as precision as the American ones? Not sure. Steam Richards, Iron builds a couple more unicorns. It's not a carrot. Who jugs the dummy out first? Uh, <laughs> probably actually the US Navy. But because the Japanese would like to use it as a justification themselves. So probably the US Navy gets uh, jug jugs it more. But if the RN, I, I often think that would be an interesting thing. If the RN had matched the build of Illustrious, this would be unicorns. They'd gone, every Illustrious we order, we are ordering unicorn. That would have changed things in World War II quite dramatically. Because that would have basically given Britain four light fleet carriers at the same time as they got the four armour carriers. That was quite useful battle groups. This is Foxo. Just how vulnerable was how MC Legend 13H? As it launched Foxo, how just how vulnerable was HS Warspite on a meander up at Sir Norwegian Fjord? Uh, the well, let's put it this way: if the German torpedoes launched from their submarines had worked, she would have possibly been hit by about five or six torpedoes, depending on how you consider it. You think uh, so? She'd have been sunk. So that's how vulnerable she was. Uh, Jason, your poodle is infinitely less mouthy about squirrels than my Pyrene uh, Pyrenees. Mm. He's being well. He, it's it's dark. He's well behaved now. He can't see them as well. Uh, he tries. He's Dawson, very droll. Cosmos, you are perusing an uncatalogued ancient library with translators. Which state in era's naval history chronicle do you hope to find that otherwise been lost the ages? Carthage. Carthage. I wonder if so. they are the most developed of the Phoenician navies. So they are the most likely to give us the uh, both the history of the Phoenicians and the idea for where they came from. Because as as know, the Phoen Phoenicians are the root people for the Greek navies. And therefore, the root people for the, um, you know, the roots for the Carthaginian navies, and therefore the roots for the, uh, the Roman navies. And yet, we know very little about the Phoenician navy. We know all next nothing about the Carthaginian navy, really, other than what the archaeology tells us. And the archaeology tells us what infrastructure they built specifically for the navy. It doesn't tell us what that navy was. So, Carthage. Colin Cameron, if the Queen Elizabeth Battle Group went back in time, I think it would be like the ship's library and maintenance facilities. That would be the most important thing. It would advance both material science and nuclear weapons. It would advance everything. No, no, no. Your thoughts on the Congo class of 14 swapped for 16. If you left everything else the same and you just put in 16 inch guns rather than 14 inch in their designs, then they're very powerful, but they're very, uh, they're very powerful ships and they're certainly going to scare the Americans. But they're all, and probably to some extent the British, but ultimately they're also glass cannons. In that you need to upgrade the armor and etc. If you're going to put in 16s, and you need to probably have something in the region of some speed of power upgrade and speed uh, to get them to the distance. MC Legend 38, if war was delayed till 1949, giving the Germans the time to complete the Zeta plan, what would the other world navies look like? How numbers would they would they be? RN, USN, IGN, RN, Soviet Navy, Marine National. Soviet Navy, who freaking knows, depends on how long Stalin stays alive for and whether he's obsessed with Navy stuff. 
Marine Machinal are probably building many, many variations on the Rikulu. IJN. Okay, well, they've pretty much gone near the military industrially bankrupt in 1943, but that's war starting. And if they've still got the things going on, the war hasn't started in 1941. Um, so they found some way to survive without worry, without having to go to war and declare war to actually get the resources. Uh, they probably have completed like another two, maybe four Super Yamatos, i.e. the really big things they were planning about. Maybe. Maybe someone's had sense. Maybe, maybe Admiral Yonai has managed to kill off whoever keeps promoting the Yamato and has managed to get some carriers built. You never know. Yonai would be going for it. Um, the USN and the Royal Navy would be completely different. There wouldn't be a single ship in them which you would recognize from World War, from World War I. And honestly, quite a lot of the ships which we associate with World War II, the town class, and uh, to an extent the Clevelands, and possibly Saratoga, Lexington, those sort of things, they wouldn't be in service anymore. They'd be completely rechanged out. The Royal Navy would probably look, they look very, very different. I love that sweater. Yeah, he's a fluffy poodle and he needs a sweater. Um, you sneeze, maybe you dropped a biscuit. He's always having. The sweater is cute. Keeps him warm. Uh, there's a boxer. World War I breaks out in 1909 when a Polish nationalist from the Russian Poland, from Russia and Poland, suggested it's the Austrian Empire. How does one go if it starts early? Uh, ooh. If one starts that early, then you have issues. For starters, the pre-dreads are going to have to be far more part of the British fighting line because they don't have as many dreadnoughts. Honestly, the number of dreadnoughts in service is actually more, far more similar than the British uh, than it would be later on. So the difference between the British and German fleet is not as much. The French fleet is nowhere near ready. The French army is nowhere near ready. Um, the only army which is, to an extent, reformed and capable is probably the British army. But even that's for imperial policing, not for actually fighting the European war. Uh, honestly, the Germans will probably end up facing another taxi scenario at the gates of Paris. Um, and it probably turns into a slightly earlier, slightly less technologically advanced, ultimately more painful version of World War I. Some marine technology is especially good, that not anywhere near where it's going to be five years later. Submarine tech, that's it, those five years are very important to submarine tech. So, honestly, the Battle of the Atlantic, as in, well, the, the, the submarine war that takes place in the, in the First World War might not happen. So the the poodles are tough dogs too. Look at them lineage and original purpose. Yeah. Originally, the original wolf in sheep's clothing. My family's had poodles for several generations, and there is a story which goes back of the... Uh, this is not World War I time. This is well into the 1800s. The men of the family were all the way, and the women were uh, back in the UK, sort of in the UK, and uh, let's put it this way, a gentleman decided he was going to try and attack them. Uh, he got taken out by the dog. They had, we, my family always had dogs, we know that through generations, but they had a lot of dogs, and apparently, uh, the story goes that a very old poodle, and we've, all, we've had poodles for several generations, um, basically, they all thought he was asleep in another room, <laughs> Came out, found the man being threatening, 
And Mickley, I'm fairly sure the ladies themselves could take care of. And um, took him out. So, yeah, never doubt the poodles. They're very, they can be very efficient when they want to be. They're incredibly loving, incredibly loyal, but the big ones, they are very, very protective. Our one has a protective He He's the softest creature you've ever known, but look in any way menacing towards my mom and sister, um, you do not want to be there. Well, thanks you've been a fire. When I first watched, uh, started watching you, um, you were talking and asking someone off camera if they had a fluffy research assistant for you. I thought you were referring to an actual co-ed assistant. I was, I was quite taken aback I went until I realised you met a dog. Yeah, uh, I, I, I have my dogs and my fluffy research assistants. I'm a historian. If I actually have a human research assistant, then someone's given me a massive grant. A massive grant. I occasionally have colleagues who are basically treatise assistants, but they are no, no they're not, no, not called that. Usually they're called uh, they usually called the master student. <sighs> sure, Matt. Yeah, Russian uh, precision guiding munitions. Um, I heard that they don't have their own GPS satellites, so they're just pre-programming for the initial airport or launch point, and then using internal navigation. And that is. An issue they are suddenly experiencing. I take out everyone. If Europe war held till 1942, what is most likely going to going after Bismarck? Two lions and a two lions, a lion plus vanguard, or two vanguards? Um, does this mean Hood is not going to face Bismarck and Denmark's right? Hood might still be there, but Hood was probably in refit by that point, and it's probably either a lion and a vanguard. Um, I think that was available. Probably a lion and a vanguard, because there's probably a couple of vanguard, two to three vanguards in service and two to three lions in service. And the King George V's are probably in the Mediterranean. Um, scaring the Italians. Or at least trying to look scary with, uh, versus the Vittorios. Vittorios and going, yeah, well, scary. We've got 14 inch guns. Oh, they got, they got 15. Ah, epic! We've got lots of fourteen-inch guns. Yeah. Hopefully, the Italians haven't used the last three years to actually fix their munitions issues, or we're going to be losing some ships. <laughs> Digressions. Phoenicians are key. They are much more than the history has led us to believe. They had settlements in North Af America, in my opinion. I'm not sure about North America, but, and this is going to sound strange, there are people who think North America. I don't think North America. I think that the Phoenicians got anywhere, and if you consider where they'd be coming out of the Mediterranean, I don't think it'd be North America, but I think they might have made it to South America and um, Latin America areas. If you follow the trade winds, North America is more problematic for them to get to into the style of craft they've got, but South America, you can get seasonally good winds uh, there and back, which is what the Spanish and the Portuguese used. So I don't know if they had settlements. I think they might have visited there because they had very good sailors. Very, very good sailors in the Phoenicians. That's what I thought for so. What would you do if we found a longship and abandoned Viking settlement on Mars? Panic. Well, first thing you have to go if you found that is there a berserker coming to take you out? Two, secondly, you have to figure out how did they get there? And probably start worshipping Odin because the only option is that uh, Norse gods are real, a la Asgard from a star. Uh, uh, the. Um, Ala are the Asgardians from Stargate SG One. That's good. They've got the Glonass system, which is the Russian version of GPS. I'm not sure it's accuracy, but I'm sure the military actually is better than the thing civilian received today. Yeah, but 
the GLONASS system is um, like the GPS. You can do jamming, etc. on them. And if I was... Let's put it this way. If I was the Ukrainians and I was looking at a very easy way to try and cause trouble for the Russians, it would be to work out a way of jamming GLONASS. Which, considering the amount of Ukrainian involvement in its original construction, is not something I would put past them being able to do. Because let's be honest, it you can there are various versions of jamming. There is some very sophisticated stuff where you're doing frequency hopping and you're watching things and carefully or there is brute force. And brute force, if you know the system, is usually doable. Not tough. If an R and carry group went back to World War One, I, I think nineteen sixties Eagle and Ark Royal would be the best as they could have have the WE seven one seven nuclear bombs award. We have way more of a problem than QE. Um World War One. Yeah, do you really want nuclear bombs going back though to World War One? Um, though I do admit that the Queen Elizabeth class are probably overkill, with F 35Bs would be overkill. And supporting uh, F 35Bs would be far more difficult to support than jet engine aircraft, a simple jet engine aircraft, like relatively simple jet engine aircraft, like in the 1960s. Buccaneers and sea vixens. Hello, Cascadian. Having a great day. Just had a quick question in regards to what's the best book you know of on the British campaign in the Far East Model 2? Looking to learn about Burma Act. Um. If you want to know about Burma, if you want to know about Burma, then Slim's own book is probably the best book to start off with. Uh, that's definitely by and far the one of the best ones. Um, mm, mm. No, I hate that book. No, I hate that one. Uh, <laughs> Andy Boyd's Eastern Fleet is probably the best one. I, have, I, I can't see it around anymore, but I was actually using it earlier. Again, this is happening to me. Why do you do this to me, books? Why, when I, wa when I want to talk to you about them to on the camera, do you get camera shy and disappear? Where have you gone, Eastern Fleet? Where have you gone? Why do you do this to me? Why? It's not fair. Cruelty to Alex. Oh, where have you gone? I don't want to stand up. My back's hurting. Uh, I got his, his intelligence book is down here, but where has Eastern Fleet gone? Where has Eastern Fleet gone? Andy Boyd's book is the best one. Stop, Andy Boyd. Um, it's basically the British Eastern Fleet. Lynch print of victory. That and Slim's book, those two will tell you pretty much everything you need to know about the British and the Far East if you want a starting point and then find the books which are the special, uh, specific areas which are more interesting to you. <sighs> Seam Richards. Triple Targon. Did the Chip Vickers offer the Japanese triple 14s for the Congos? Yes, they did. Which would again be a bit scary for the Americans. I don't know, this is probably an easy answer, so sorry. Without exception, factor that, uh, without the exertion factor, that was World War Two. How long has the battleship ship continued to be considered viable weapons for top form? Probably into the 1960s, if not even later. You see, the, 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 the thing that... This is going to sound strange. The thing that stops the battleship being considered a viable weapons platform is having to make a decision about whether it should or shouldn't be. And as long as people are still building the battleship, you're going to build it yourself. So if you don't have World War II happen the way it does then the Soviets probably build their battleships eventually, in which case the Americans and British probably build battleships to counter them, and that keeps the battleship construction going. It might well, the carrier might well supplant it still, but it would take time for it to do it, far more time if there isn't a war. So as I've said before, the carrier doesn't replace the battleship, 
in terms of ability to kill. The carrier bait replaces the battle cruiser in terms of its ability to control larger areas of water and strike. And the thing is, its range of its air group allows it to take out a battleship as long as it can engage it far enough away. The point is, though, is that a battleship is still the supreme killing ship, a ship killing system. It's still the best pound for pound ship killing system ever built. It's just it can't reach far enough with those systems. They're not long range enough. And that's where the carrier comes in. Carrier's less good at killing ships, but it's got the range, so it doesn't matter. It can ha roll the dice a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Thomas the publicly declared accuracy for GLONASS is 2.8 meters compared to the GPS of 30 centimeters. Mm hmm. Uh, Simridges, would you sack the Vickers gun salesman? No, I give him a job to Ellswick. Hire him if he's managed to keep it going. And that was the one that's Big Richards. Uh, yeah, Doctor. It was the same as my, with my old pooch. She was a big, uh, such a bag of bones at 17. She needed it. We're in Canada, so the winter was a little much for her. Hmm. Um, I'm, my, ours just doesn't like getting, getting cold. Honestly. He's the only dog I know who would literally. It, this is the thing. Um, every year, we tend, when we go up and down to Cornwall, uh, not quite often when we do it as a big family trip. I book into a place on the way down. Instead of us staying in hotels, we book air, we we book basically Airbnb or sort of little places that you can stay for a sort of night or a couple of nights on the way down. Because my mum likes to do the journey. Um, uh, if if I say that I was a big surprise and called the red herring and uh, various other things by the GPs until they finally admitted that she was actually pregnant with me after six months long, um, that gives you an idea of her age group. And so I try, and because she insists on driving, and she is a very good driver, but I don't want her to, with our price, to tire herself out. So I book a trip on the way down, sort of the way back, and sort of a little cup of safe. I book a place which has a hot tub. Seems a nice, sensible thing. All right. So this is the image. You've got a big, giant hot tub. It really is. It's about uh, eight person hot tub. They have them for these places. And again, we know the people who own it, so they give us a very nice deal. It's a four bedroom sort of sort of place that we get the that we, we stay in. Um just the three of us, mom uh, you know, each our own room. Um dogs. We didn't have the corgi with us last time. We did have the corgi with us last time, yes we did. Oh yeah, but he didn't get in there. He, the corgi didn't uh, didn't get. He was still in his pen and wasn't allowed to get in it. But um, uh, it's going to sound strange. You, there is a picture somewhere of my mum, my sister, me, and the poodle all in the hot tub. And there are the three of us, uh, the the three humans, are sort of sitting in the corners, going, "Ah, oh, this is relaxing." And there's the poodle in the middle, floating on his back, going, just having a wonderful time. That's just our poodle. John Light, would Dylan Hunt uh, have led the High Guard to victory over uh, over Admiral Stark, who is so awesome she oversaw the destruction of the High Guard combat for the civilization? Bedrooms are gone by the time. He couldn't have done any worse. Uh, Submarine tech definitely changed massively in five years. USS Holland was in service in 1901. Yeah, it's just it's the, the, the five years from 1909 to 1914 makes a big difference to what the submarines can do and what you can make the submarines do and the stuff you can get involved. Uh, if Shreshmer's and Cabral's hull was laid down and converted into a carrier, 
How useful would that be for all navies? It's essentially a 1920s, 30s super carrier size. Uh, one such carrier, she would be a very fast, very big carrier, could carry a massive air group, so she'd certainly be an interesting asset. It's not one carrier that's useful. Really, if you've got three, then it's really useful. So if incomparable, um, incomparable, incorruptible, and inconceivable are all built are all so I'm sorry and also converted to carriers or at least two of them are then you have an event then you have something that's there that converted instead of um uh courageous and glorious mm. Mm. really <sighs> off to the green stores Oh, my fox is going to rule the house in the later days. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Incomparable, incor incorruptible, inconceivable, inconclusive, whatever the, the, the her sisters are called, but you need at least two of them to be useful, three preferably. If you could get three, you'd be very happy. Um, John and Burrow, uh, Burrow, what do you think of the Imperio for World of, uh, World of Warships? Battleship? It's a quad Littorio. Um, I haven't yet played it or seen it, but um, that sounds rather sensible, but it also doesn't sound very Italian. Honestly, I think they'd have either gone up a gun or... I've gone up at a turret or gone up a gun size rather than going a quad. This is the thing. The British go to quads because of the 14 inch. The French go to quad because the French are weird. Um, and they're using a weird gun, uh, gun size as well. So in the nicest way, quads aren't really something which people really want to do if they can avoid it. And I honestly think the British would have preferred to have gone for troubles. Uh, it, uh, the only person who possesses the 14 inch is Chatfield. And I think, honestly, the Royal Navy would have preferred. Well, they, they, they'd have probably preferred a four treble 14 inch turret design. Because then you'd have had 12 14 inch guns across four treble turrets, which would have been. They would have worked better than the quad. Um. The idea was you were going to get the 12 guns you wanted over three quads, which would save on tonnage in theory. That's what they were. They were after 12, 14 inch guns. That's what the British wanted. Um, but if you had a if the Iron had had a choice, they'd have wanted, well, more, bigger guns. And I think the Italians wouldn't want a quad either. I think they'd go for bigger guns and trebles. Quads are complicated. I was like, sorry, I'm like, no need to apologize. Um, John, look, if Germany had not pursued submarine building and gone for surface ship building, how much better shape would the British Empire be in 1945? Oh, massively better shape, but they'd still probably lost lots of aircraft in the Mediterranean, etc. But they'd be in a lot better shape. 
even if they'd gone more slowly into it. And um, you have to remember they do go slowly enough into it that the British managed to build up an escort force quite dramatically. Uh, that you know the yes, the British ordered flower class and the hunt class escort destroyers well before World War Two begins, but. If the if the Germans had actually put enough effort, it, 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 they put similar effort into their submarine construction in 1939 as they were putting in in 1943-44, then it could have been a very different scenario in World War Two. It could have been far more difficult because I've heard linguistic evidence for the Phoenician region in the Caribbean. There are some interesting points about that one. Did anyone ever consider harvesting rainwater as a source of boiler feed water? You wouldn't have to desunlight it. Desunlight. They did, and there are is actually a you think a, a movie where they do that. But um, the reality is, doing it on a level at which the, you need to feed your uh, your boilers is quite dramatic, and you don't get enough. You need a lot of water. And that's the trait. It's the quantity you're dealing with, rather than the quality of water. It's the quantity of water. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Ryan, who were the madmen who actually penned Tillman designs? Uh, oh, uh, it wasn't the U.S. Navy. It was the other engineering department of the um, U.S. government. Basically, they were the only ones who were. Uh, had the required skilled people to do it, but they basically are just inventing whatever's they sent their way. All right, so after the year of the cruiser, do we get the year of the battle cruiser followed by the year of the battleship, then the year of the carrier? I was considering the year of the frigate, but I might go well, this that, that would allow me to get Star Trek, I'm uh, allowing me to get Voyager in and possibly Defiant. Mm. But it would be sort of more interesting on some other ships. Or does the year of the carrier? Or, you know, I, I'm going to think about it. But I've got a, a few months to think about what my year of next year is going to be. I will take suggestions, but I might not listen to them. That's right. I was looking at the images of Hood's wreck, and how can magazine detonation underwater make turrets and gun come off their barbettes? Pressure. Um, it, it can, the, the amount of pressure coming can, if necessary, build up and send them off. But also, there's always the thing that the, they can be not quite on, if the, the hull hasn't has rocked a bit as it's gone down, they can be off. It's quite a violent thing, sinking as a ship. Not really. It's very rare. It's a smooth glide to the bottom. More of a crash. Night uh, no, time It's practice that at least uh, sometimes to spend mo uh, send money to a project that it need then it need more money to a project than it needs and siphon off the excess of money to a black project. There are rumors this happened with the B two and F thirty five programs. Is there any instance of such a thing happening in the Royal Navy and Navy, Royal Navy, US and Navy, or others? Um, y y y the, let's put it this way: uh, the dive bombing site which Vickers produces for the skewer class, a skewer um, dive bomber, comes out of freaking nowhere. And apparently, somehow, Vickers has been developing completely off scratch with no and uh, no money this new site, and it's the similar with some of the engines. And things that the fleet of the Royal Navy is working on in, uh, that suddenly has available in World War Two, and they're things which the Royal Navy wasn't supposed to be doing and was definitely not involved in, but the Air Ministry wasn't giving the funding for it. Admiralty was giving. The thing is, the Admiralty is giving a rather large amount of money to Vickers to develop sites and equipment. The thing is, it's not that it's not that impossible to imagine that they're using some of the money which is being uh, supposedly for the ship development is also funding development of, you know, the the site for the aircraft. 
That certainly makes sense. There's a few projects like that in history. You can usually find them because usually there's a reason that co that company is getting money which is legitimate. And then suddenly when close to the war or something, they need something, suddenly appear. It's been being developed anyway and it's available. Reference it. Given the Ukrainians seem to be doing quite well, do you see a return of robustly supplied proxy wars? Oh, we can hope not. That's really not good. But mm, there might be some stuff. Oh, Graham Handler, nukes and all. Well, yeah, depending on when those carrier groups arrive, they could have Churchill, World War I Churchill, as the first Lord of the Admiralty. Um, Dirt Squad. Are any Russian aircraft getting close to NATO borders that they have a position where they're losing bomb hitting NATO troop forces? That would be interesting. Malaga, this is what happens when you don't give the books their shells. Yeah. Dirt Rock. Glass is mostly navigation, I think. The Russians use a lot of Western components of GPS in the smart bombs. Mm. I wonder if those Star Wars took possession of Jordan. Tillman's the biggest ship design you can think of. Happy naval architect noises. Yeah, this is when we really need to have, you know, Mel um, oh, uh, Pine Martin. If we had M uh, Pine Martin and Emily on here, um, uh, that we, we soon hear of the, you know, what the concept of the happy naval architect noises are. Uh, my own father, I would say, not so happy if someone told him to design in Tillman because he'd be going, what is the practical purpose of this monstrosity? My dad liked to design ships which were going to get built and put into service. He didn't like designing things which were paper dragons, as he called them. Also calling them paper dragons. Hmm. Tillman was very anti-USM when it came to military spending, uh, spending. They knew he had would vote down anything they sent to the Joint Committee for spending, so they spent, sent an oversized design. And the design they actually wanted to build. Tillman would then reluctantly vote for the regular design. Hmm. Sounds funny it can work people out like that. Uh, also sure. Aircraft carriers are also much more fle are more flexible with the ability to change the weapons systems they have. Yeah, you change the aircrew. That's the thing with the aircraft carriers. That is an advantage. I do admit it. I think I've said it before. Hmm. How useful would a F-35 be for the US in World War II? Um, F-35B be for the US in World War II. Uh, you don't really need a stealth jet in World War II, do you? Uh, to be honest, although if you do have a stealth jet, bye-bye most of the air forces. Um, radar, all those things. You could... You, let's put it this way. The US government would not uh, turn it away. Whether or not they could sustain it and operate it is a different matter, but they wouldn't turn it away. No one would turn it away an f would be in World War II. The Russians, that's hilarious. That would be really funny to see. The dog is obviously some other made up in style. It's a sign of something. Yeah, it is a sign of something. Mm hmm. Shan, you keep using those hulls. I do not think it does what do you, do you think it does. And you think HMS Inconceivable? It's the fourth in class HMS. Hello, my name is Neo Montaya. Neo Montaya? Possibly. I was sure. The motto, you killed our ships, prepare to die. <laughs> uh, the, the, the point is, if you're going to use the incomparable hulls, uh, you know, you have to do something with them. 
they could be a good aircraft carrier. Let's be honest, if you've got incomparable hulls, the Royal Navy would not complain about the aircraft carrier produced. <sighs> Inexplicable? Possibly. No, Scott. The aircraft itself, not very useful. Lack of logistics chain. The tech inside the aircraft is about as much as useful. Putting M61 20mm in front of B-17. The head one way. Ooh. It quickly becomes the worst instead of the best way to attack a bottle stream. Mm. Hang on, reactions. Okay, dumb one here, but if the Battle of Malaya is won and Singapore does not fall, do you end up getting an HMS Singapore? And if so, what the sh uh, what ship does that get her name? An aircraft carrier. And probably... Probably one of the Malta classes is called Singapore. Also, if Malaya doesn't... If, Battle of Mal if Malaya is won and Singapore doesn't fall, uh, then you have a very interesting operation because, honestly, the U uh, does Japan and get the Dutch East Indies in those areas because they've got to, if they fall, fail to get Singapore, they've then got the force and they get trying to get Singapore. The British are immediately tied more into the Pacific for war. Um, you could end up with the U.S. with Roosevelt getting his dearest, dearest wish and being able to avoid. Putting MacArthur in charge of Southeast Asia because he could claim it's an Anglo Australian led force. I'm not saying it actually would. I'm 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 saying basically anything to stop MacArthur being in charge. Anything. Roosevelt would be just going, you were hey. MacArthur could be in charge of the land forces and maybe a Royal Navy Admiral as theatre commander. That'd be quite funny. Who would I send out? Well, like, I, you know who I would like to send out, but who would probably be sent out in that circumstance? Couldn't be Somerville. If Singapore hasn't fallen, then probably for, uh, Force Z hasn't been sunk, so that means Phillips would be in charge. But if you're fear to command the Fanag Force, you want an Admiral of the Fleet. <laughs> well, the options are Lord Gorgavori. No way! Uh, Pound? No. Cunningham, possibly. Sending out Cunningham to deal with MacArthur, I'm not sure which one it's cruel on. Cunningham, for having to deal with the Poppin' Jay, or MacArthur, for what Cunningham would do to him. Da, 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 da. Lots of Tum and chat going on. MC Legend 30H. Uh, were there any plans for Royal Navy cruisers post type class cruisers and were modern cruisers like US Tikronga or class cruisers? Yeah, the Royal Navy did work on other cruiser designs, and you have to remember we did, did build famously the through deck cruisers called the Invincibles. So, yeah, we did work on cruisers. Ozark the Goat. This is Voyager as a destroyer, not a frigate. Change my mind. They call them an ex. Uh, they, they call her a frigate. For some reason, in the this is one of the things I find the, the when we are looking at Star Trek in terms of the universe on screen, they have cruisers and they have frigates. If and okay, yeah, theoretically escorts in the case of the Dutch land, but they don't ever show their destroyers. They don't really show the destroyers on screen. And yet, if you put any of the games, the destroyers are really cool ships and really useful ships. And before anyone asks, no, I don't think the below deck ships is a destroyer. I think that's probably more of a corvette. Cerritos.
That's right. What happens in the, the RN command if Hood's Vice Admiral Captain survived? And why did they choose to go down the ship? They didn't really get any choice to go down the ship. It kind of took them out before they had a chance to get off it. And if they survive, they probably get used and put in charge of ships and fleets again. After all, you don't have that many Vice Admirals and not, not that many ca Captains of that experience. Mr. Vox, on the topic of the Phoenicians in New World, have found a Basque coinage from the 6th century in the destroyed, abandoned, mainland cities. Hmm. Interesting. The forward turrets were in a broadside position before the bow went under. Hmm. John Sav, what if in August 1940 the UK made a joint Pacific command with Aussies, Dutch, New Zealanders, kind of like Abdacom, about the Americans, but 18 months earlier, and gave the command to Keys? Uh, that would have been a very interesting scenario, and if they'd given it to Keys, he would have started organising things. You would probably have had... It's going to sound strange. You would have uh, had a far more integrated and built up structure. You'd have probably find, uh, found things were being accelerated along. You'd probably find that the Indian Navy got their destroyers quicker. You'd probably find the Aussies got their destroyers quicker. And any sh the ships would all be organized in a different way. Um, Keyes, remember, was an archetype of the what he called the flotilla defense strategy. So he would have been putting defensive flotillas, submarines, etc., forward. Uh, defensive uh, flotillas very good of destroyers of submarines forward and mine layers, and he'd be keeping the battle fleet back. He that was something he really did argue after the First World War experience and after its interwar interwar experience. He certainly wouldn't have agreed with Phillips's idea of bringing the battle uh, of bringing the far ships to Singapore, because no matter what statement it is, it's that that's no use if they are quickly picked off. And you really want those in a position they can appear from where you need them to appear from. And he would like the strategic ambiguity of having them slightly further away so they could be made to appear from, let's say, instead of coming out of the Singapore route, of coming to South China Sea from a different angle. Um, I, I've gone more into what Keys, I think, would have done. I think he would have organized the command quite a sort of differently. Done. Have you asked me? Would like me to uh, ask Pine to pop on? Have you uh, quite good friends with her? Oh, but if she's on, she's on to chat away about that. But I think she she'd enjoy a conversation about Tillman class. It's kind of like um, I'm 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 tempted to uh, message my lovely friend who uh, helped me with the. Uh, message uh, sort of Mia. And ask, uh, see if she's on, because we're talking sci-fi ships, and uh, really, Mia should be around for that. <laughs> there, lady. Someone's searching for me on on um, using Google at the moment. Oh, that's cool. They could just find me by just looking at, logging onto my YouTube account. I'm here if you're searching for me in Google. Um, Circle of Doom. Hmm. Everything is Circle of Doom. I haven't been told anything circling them. The lady? Ren. Uh, the... John Luke, of the major Star Trek power, uh, of the major Star Trek had never powers, what would the politics of each apply? Alpha, Beta, plus Dominion, Frankie. Oh, good God. If. If the Federation had Nova bombs, they would be probably just as bad as the Commonwealth. But they would probably have the policy that they would all be stored under Admiral's orders. And it would be a case of probably some of those really hard line admirals would end up using them far too freely, which would make them far more uh, far more under control. But they'd be some last ditch weapons for destroying systems if um, 
the Borg came from. Uh, da -da -da -da. As for the Ferengi, they'd be trying to sell them to everyone. The Cardassians would use them. The Romulans would be blowing up people and trying to claim they don't exist. The, the Klingons wouldn't like them because they destroy a planet, and the whole point of the Klingons is to take the planet, not destroy the whole system. Uh, the for, uh, the Dominion probably would use them on every system which had solids in, and then try and rebuild things. Come, you can take a full squadron of Harriers or a flight of F thirty V. F thirty V. What are you taking? Uh as good as the Sea Harriers are, and probably taking the F thirty five Bs. Probably depends what my mission is. Uh, Danny Thumps, I know. I think I know why Commonwealth lacked a doctor and for no bombs. The veterans knew about the solar avatars. There's even a species of humanoid veterans to interact with them. Since stars is a sentient being, they're a nation. Any use of no bombs on a star is an act of war against a neutral nation. One whose citizens can summon miniature suns to destroy you. Uh, combine the fact that they constitute uh, all star, uh, they constitute all stars, not just the three galaxies. I really want to go with the water and not to think about other celestial bodies. I suspect that there are not very nice conversation the first Nova Bomb was used. Come off Nova Bombs probably exist to counteract rogue avatars. Mm. The trouble is, and this is going to sound strange, is if you have no. Uh, that If that was the case, then you would expect there to be a doctrine. Because uh, when you have no doctrine, they can either be. They might be used, they might not be used. So that's the thing is, if you have a doctrine, you have if you don't know how to have a doctrine, you have no control over whether they're used or not used. The fact that they're not used comes down to the Commonwealth officers and the fact that they are really not necessarily war mo war officers. Um, if you've been facing a harder line military force, mm, they'd have probably got used a lot, and there'd be a lot of upset avatars. So with that doctrine. So that, that the thing is, Daniel, I understand your point, and I do agree, uh, do, uh, do see, see that line of thinking, but the fact is then that would mean, you that would, that should mean you you definitely have a doctrine to have even more control over their use. <laughs> Rapper, I am criticizing an author's use of mathematics in a review or in the proper English use criticizing their math, their math or criticizing their maths? Criticizing their maths. That's for sure. I guess that's an interesting question. What was the bigger loss, Hood or Holland? Hood would have been going into refit soon, so it wouldn't have been available for that long anyway. Holland would have been useful to have because we were short of very senior, of senior skilled or skilled senior officers at that point. Hello, PME. PME? Well, a bit late, but paper designs are a lot more important than most people give them credit for. Designing should take practice. It does. Although. My dad never liked designs which just existed on paper, as I said. He called them paper dragons. Uh, nine corrections. Alternative timeline here. It's 1944. The UK has sufficient the US to not play ball and share the nukes agreement and starts something a nuclear program. Uh, starts something a nuclear program. So, uh, so how's that when the uh, rug is pulled out, not as a shot? Okay. But Ritz get a bomb in 47. They immediately work on H bombs, assuming that we have something that some of the smartest Edward Teller on our side. Get the H bomb for the US. How does it affect the UK government going forward? Yes, I know this is insane. Um, it's not as insane as you'd think, and yes, Britain does have. Um, you've added PS. Britain is not bankrupt. Mm, as I said before, Britain is not really bankrupt at the end of World War Two. It's bank not bankrupt at the end of World War One either. But World War Two does put it in more trouble than World War Two. But it's just choosing to pay back the death as fast as it does. And the other things they start constituting at the end of World War Two. That's what costs the money. Um, if they have them, 
UK going forward is still one uh, is from the earlier point one of the primary major powers, and there's the fact that to an extent it's a far more co-equal thing between Britain and America. Probably the the status is uh, Britain is still probably slightly reduces down and becomes the secondary Western power, but it's not quite as low as it becomes if that makes sense it probably stays at the sort of level at which you will have prior to the Suez crisis between the world war ii and the Suez crisis where it's the not the uh, where america is the primus into paras of the leaders but britain is very much the opto into paras for a second Dan Raymond, given keys command of special risk might also take advantage of background to quietly remove MacArthur. Uh, probably not quietly remove MacArthur, but maybe cr make him cry a bit. Uh, I, I can't imagine Keyes tolerating MacArthur doing my, uh, getting out to his jokes. Hello, RN, uh, Royal Navy study. Hi, it's KGB. Hello. Hi, Siren. Are you saying Vice Admiral Holland and Captain K were either possibly incapacitated or dead before the Battle of September? I'm suggesting that a large number of the crew were in uh, were in trouble before the battle slipped under. The fact that so few of the crew get off is either means that they were sucked down or they didn't get a chance to get off, which means they were in shock. As according to what I read, Vice Admiral Holland is still in his seat and Captain Keir was standing right beside him. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that they are in any position to, to sort of take off. It's, there is lots of things read about, uh, read about, but also remember the people who did survive were not necessarily the closest to where they were by the time they were knocked down. And I don't always trust those accounts at that point. It's a nice thing to imagine them still in their seat and in uh, standing right beside their admiral as they go down, rather than maybe crumpled on the floor in shock from a thing or lolling in their seat. Or there are lots of things that are going to happen when they have a big explosion in a ship. It can do a lot of things to a human body. This is what do you think of the circular Russian a a battleships, Admiral Popos? Um, I think they're a nice idea to make a floating island, a moving island, but I'm not really sure of their purpose as a battleship. However, is it, given the need to rapidly acquire warships at the start of Evil World War, did only a on RN actually say in writing, this is why we should have kept X or Y? No, but they fought it rather loudly and there were various interesting things written. The Royal Navy, uh, th there is actually a paper I think I once read of some. Well, was it in the archives? It wasn't a mythical paper, it was actually a real paper in the archives, I think, which mentioned HMS Tiger quite a lot. And it kept referring to uh, the, the, the uh, sort of positions of various ships. And was talking, it kept mentioning how this, sh this sh the ship would do this role, but it wouldn't have done, it didn't do it as well as Tiger would have done. And you sit there and go, okay, yes, we understand, you wanted Tiger to be kept. Hey, Wayne. Uh, hi, folks. Would love to stick up on explaining to people why Russian infrastructure doesn't exist in one area. Nah, it's always fun. John Smith, South. Cisco would use no forms. Yep. Mitch notes. I give the 45,000 ton 28 knot Nelson a try new do. Oh, my lord. <laughs> you had fun. Uh, John South, let's see. If you were a spaceborne sib, Civilization, would it be better to have separate exploratory service from the fleet? In a war, large quick cruisers that could be better off better use fighting closer to home space. Um also in this situation would it be better to use a civil service? It, it prevents a loss of advanced tech. Uh, the, the, the trouble is, do you really want to send someone into deep space on their uh, deep space without protection? You're not going to. So they're gonna end up being a military unit anyway, because of the way they're going. 
the thing I always find annoying is that they send only a single ship. And in if you consider, look at all the missions of the research missions. It's rare than an exploration journey going into a high threat zone. Exploration is a single ship. Usually it's a pet. And I think that would have made more I would make more sense for them. Come, I seem to remember the chieftain saying recent uh, recently saying to listen to bilge pumps, uh, hoping he'll be on soon. If he wants to be on soon, it'll be great fun to have him. But I, I, I haven't talked to him yet. May, uh, maybe Drac has. Drac is a Drac pass with uh, the chieftain one night. But it'd be good to have him if he wants to be on. Hello, if you end this while I'm away from the keyboard, thank you and good night. Thank you. I'm not going to be ending it for a little while. About another half hour, I think. Well, I sorry, the golly, the channel's grown since last year. Um, hopefully, it's growing even more. I wanted to get to at least ten thousand subscribers soon. That's my target amount because that makes a difference with certain things, including the um, uh, the Spreadshirt store. That's the point at which the Spreadshirt store you can get that band in down below. And the thing, the reason I want that is I want to see, see how many people really do buy the Blackburn Blackburn versus the Catalina stuff. Hello, come to the barbecue house. Oh, thank you. Um, Nice room. Why did captains choose to go down their ship? It seems nonsensical. There is the thing that they that's there showing they're assuming the ultimate responsibility for their ship and for what's happened, but there's also this is gonna sound strange. That tradition to an extent has come from officers not wanting to leave their men behind. If they've got wounded and they've got dying on their ship and they're not gonna get off and they don't go. There's, a, there, you see, there's quite a long tradition of captains being the last person to leave their ship when it's sinking. That's a long, long tradition. And so I think the fact is, when there being people who can't get off the ship, the captain goes down with them to share their same fate and look after them as they in the death as they can't look after them in life, sort of thing. If that makes sense. I think that's where that's come from, but the long tradition is of the captains being the last to leave their ship. And if other people can't get off... Robert Lukes, UK having nukes is no big thing to other uh, 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 to the other. Giving nukes to France was a problematic move made by NATO. Uh, France was developing their nukes anyway. But... You know, we always have to make sure, we, Britain has to make sure it has nukes because the French have nukes and we just don't trust our nukes. Time moment. CO should be last on the ship, but that doesn't mean they have to hang around and wait to die. No, it depends on their, intel, uh, their view of these things sometimes. Sometimes don't, they do. They don't, they get the full responsibility for a rogue. And that's what said. The Franco-British Union proposal goes ahead in 1943 and forms a functional state with France as the lesser partner post World War II. How does this affect the early Cold War? It makes for a very. It makes for a unified power. You, uh, Franco-British, if they've managed to work it out and get it working, state in uh, is a very interesting nation state. Uh, let's just hand wave them and say it gets to work. Uh, you would have a large army, large navy, and a very large economy. Combine that with the legacy of empire, the two would combine, and probably, let's say, a British-style approach to empire, i.e. turning into a commonwealth, uh, you could uh, combine with the French approach to empire, which would be trying to make it an economic thing, you'd probably end up with the commonwealth turned into something far more like a sort of 
uh, almost a European Union style economic linking in as well. You probably get the come off having an economic, uh, economic large economic component, a, a trade component, as well as um, the cultural and other political and other ties it has going on. As a sort of the there's an informal economic component to the come off, but there's not a formal one. It'd be a probably formalized one. So yeah, that would probably be the impact. It'd be on the early Cold War. It would mean that there was definitely America, as powerful as it is with France and Britain rebuilt to an extent, and let's be honest, we probably qualify for martial aid at that point, uh, and a huge amount of martial aid, mm, you'd probably be dealing with a very, very big economy in Europe. And it might not stop with just Frank, uh, France and Britain joining together. You see other countries might decide that they want to join the, uh, the, 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 the Franco-British Union proposal. Yeah. You could end up with the Dutch, Especially could be options and Belgium. Part of it. As the wonderful Pine Martin Emily's just said, the Russian circular battleships weren't battleships at all, just monitors. In inland mobile gun platforms, they work quite well, albeit with low rate of fire. Yeah, basically floating islands, Mo uh, moving islands. Unless it's the captain of the Costa Concordia, then he's the first. Yeah, and look at the trouble he got into. In the nicest way, he will never get a ship again. He couldn't. Well, he, he not only broke the rules, he broke the traditions. Oh, well, look. If the entire and the Italian fleet does not happen, how much the more difficult does, is the Iron's Mediterranean fleet mission to defeat the Italian Navy? Tremendously more difficult. Because it doesn't buy them at a time, so it has to happen at some point. The thing is, if Taranto didn't happen then, it would probably have happened later. At some point, because the Italian Navy likes to get together all together in the same port, so at some point, British are going to attack it. I think you should try to learn Portuguese, especially if you think Portuguese naval history is underrated. Um, I've considered it. To be fair, I haven't had a Portuguese girlfriend. I had a Spanish girlfriend, but I haven't had a Portuguese one. So, you know, I learned a bit of Spanish then. Not much. Uh, for, uh, nice agreement. Thoughts on the Russian, land, uh, uh, Russian Navy landing ship being sunk? This is why one doesn't like to offload troops into a port. Everyone can tell where you are. And it doesn't require much effort to work it out and get things in range. This is why we go over the beach. Because we can put the ships where we want. And we can also, and that's why the other advantage of going over the beach is your air defence systems don't have to deal with the conflict of dealing with a city all around you. There are advantages to offloading over a beach. But the fact is offloading in a port allows you more volume, theoretically. However, that particular port is not a particularly good place to offload because you have to do everything by crane because the sides are too high so your ramps can't go down and few things can't drive off. Which is why you probably shouldn't have been using that port. But the Russians are probably planning on using a different port when they first originally idea, put the idea together, but they ain't got to that port yet. Bailon, I've read a Russian soldier surrendered himself on his T-72 B-3 tank for seven and a half grand. Which Russian ship would you like, and are you setting up a crown fund? Peter Veliki! And I'm not sure if I would have enough for a crown uh, for a crown fund for that, but Peter Veliki! Nuclear-powered battle cruiser. This is How do you, as a historian commentator, decide what is a nation's claim capability versus actual capabilities? How do you decide how much of the propaganda is real? Okay. 
that is often a complicated one and it comes down to an assessment and you have to sort of use a bit of history in that which countries have a habit of overclaiming which countries have a habit of underclaiming that's a real thing some countries will have propaganda our ships are amazing but they will only claim their capabilities for example I would say the Royal Navy and the Washington Naval Treaty is underclaiming its capabilities quite a big chunk because that suits their argument at that time. So ultimately, it's a bit of a judgment call, but ultimately it's also based on experience of looking at that country, looking at the results and looking at what they have done previously. It's one of the things I find in Star Wars, they get really right is when you're talking about Thrawn and his approach of looking at the culture and using that to examine a people and really work them out. Well, to be honest, that's what a historian really does. We take a culture and we examine it inside out and we work out what they're really like. And sometimes that culture is good and easy to work out, and sometimes that culture isn't so good and easy to work out. But that culture will ultimately have an impact on how much reality their propaganda has. For example, the Americans don't tend to lie about the actual, the actual weapon systems. They lie, when I say lie, they exaggerate, bend the truth, modify things when they talk about the accuracy of their system. The Americans always over always believe their own hype in terms of their accuracy of their systems. It doesn't matter which generation they do, they always believe they're far more accurate than they actually are. Even as accurate as they are, which is usually pretty darn good, the American, in terms of their propaganda and what they say, is always it's far more accurate than it actually is. The British, on the other hand, will always believe their weapons fire can fire faster than they do. So the British propaganda usually stresses that the ships can fire a lot faster. Which is why when I use the calculations for results of working out guns, I tend to go for the slightly slower ones. The Germans always believe they're producing the most perfect design ever. The Italians always produce, believe, presume it's the most beautiful. And that comes through in their way they're approaching things. So you start to learn what you're looking to filter out of what they're saying. So when the Italians are talking about the beauty and the grace of the design, etc., you start to learn. Well, hang on, that's the stuff that's going to cut obscure the fact. That's the that's the bit they're going to they're going to waffle on about a bit to obscure other things. So I need to look past that to an extent. So it it's. As I said, it's a bit of a learning curve, but you get there. And sometimes you're wrong. And that's the first thing you have to admit. You have to admit, be able to admit when you're wrong. And look, I remember the Italian Coast Guard recording, the telling the captain to get back to your ship and do your duty, you card. Yep. MC Legend, if Adrian's Ball Spike was one of the most accurate British ships that was preserved in the museum, where should we, would she where would she be? Would she be where Belfast is and Belfast would be elsewhere? No, because Belfast can fit where she is. Ball Spike can't. Um Honestly, you'd have three spaces you can put what you could put War Spite. Uh, you'd have to have used one of the dry docks, one of the graving docks in Portsmouth. One of the graving docks in Liverpool, or one of the graving docks in Southampton, or one of the graving docks in Newcastle. Um, that's your options. Maybe one of the graving docks up in Scotland, but you would have to find a big graving dock you could stick her in to protect her. That you could write off. And the odds are you go for one of the ones in major cities. So you would be either Southampton or Liverpool or Newcastle.
And she's built at Devonport, so that could be a one where she goes back to. That would be a good. Uh, that would be a spot she might be sent to, Devonport. That's another option, another graving dock down there. Um, probably try and get her into number eight or number nine. And turn that into a museum area. Oh, oh, adapt Moon Cove. Which is not far from the Tall Point Steam Ferry and all that stuff there and down there. So that might be there. Moon Cove would probably be the one I'd try and adapt if I could. Uh, but you know, it, it it's that sort of scenario. It's it, it, it's finding a space which is suitable to look after the ship, preferably where you can protect from salt water. Uh, yeah, Devonport maybe, Liverpool is another possible strong possibility. Liverpool's the largest sort of city you could get into the city centre of. Newcastle is another option. But yeah. That's I'll take an SASN. Don't remember. You just want a nuclear power battle cruiser because you've seen the price of petrol recently. Potentially. If Kimmel had sent the force to Wake Island, he, said he wanted to send, and if the Japanese scanning force had seen the force, they themselves have seen the force, would the Japanese have sent a larger force to Wake Island? They probably had to withdraw to reinforce and then send a larger force. It would have delayed things, and it would allow a massive reinforcement of Wake Island. So, yeah. It would have been interesting if they'd found it. I'm sure you've answered, but I haven't heard it, so I'm going to ask it now. Why were the Royal Navy's cannon class destroyers such short lived in our own service? Did they just become that outdated that quickly? Pretty much, and they had humongous design compromises built into them. Have you seen the hangar system? The flight, uh, the missile launcher system at the back? The guns at the front worked well, and they were probably the most reliable weapon system they had. Um, Sabaton Bismarck sign made a song made Bismarck over hype worse. Not really. The of military commanders frequently can't admit full. Yeah. Uh, Rafferos, can you explain the difference between dry dock, grave dock, and construction dock? Okay, uh, dry docks are both come in floating form and graving form. Graving is a form of dry dock, which is basically space you can put them in. Uh, construction dock, uh, construction dock, well, graving dock is what's built into the earth sort of thing. And you can seal off the end. Uh, construction dock, um, usually it's different from a graving dock in terms of its end, okay? Might sound strange, but go with me here. Construction docks, when especially these days when they're built as construction docks, Often have ramped end, uh, ramped ends, so that you can drive parts of the ship down into there. Instead of you having to crane in sections of the hull, you can stick it on those special sort of tractorish sort of vehicles, trailer tractor trailerish vehicles, uh, with have hundreds of wheels it seems, and get them down into there. But that is something newer. Otherwise, graving docks are occasionally you want to use for construction docks. For sure, Harlem Wolf, Belfast. That's an option, but then you're taking out a shipyard which is a working, uh, which is a using one, so you have to buy it off them. And as Paimon has pointed out, dry docks are vertical walls. Graving docks have steps. Construction docks are either usually vertical walls, but you can build ships there. Um, dry docks are you in the UK. Usually, you're more likely to have a graving dock than a dry dock. Uh, dry, graving dock and dry docks 
with the vertical walls are more often found in places outside the UK. That's a whole rule. And, uh, sometimes uh, some dry docks are still called graving, graving docks as well. There is a bit of a debate about the liturgy behind the name. Uh, no, the epistem uh, epistemology behind the naming. I think that was the right word. I, no, was it the right word or was it the wrong word? I think it was the right one. And that's what I said. How much of an issue is hindsight uh, for you and your students in history, and how do you bypass counter it? I always tell students to try and read history forward. So always try and read it when you're doing the archives and the sources and read it as it happened, not read backwards, read it forward. And try and get into that mindset and don't presume that people have the knowledge you have. Look and see your documents, look and see what they send their diaries, what knowledge they do have. Do not believe them to have superpowers, they don't. I'm very sorry. Why do town class crews get all the attention in the RN? Because they're cool! And because Belfast still lives. That's because they're cool and Belfast lives. And also, did you see what they. Let, let's be honest, in the nicest way, there is Birmingham facing down three heavy cruisers solo. Thank you very much. I know there was a sloop there, and I love the sloop. But let's be honest, solo facing down three heavy cruisers. That is cool. And there's Liverpool doing her piracy in the Amara incident. Privateering, piracy, random merchant, uh, uh, economic warfare stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're cool. Well, best way, a 350,000 ton battleship, does it sink destroyers with its wake? It probably sinks small islands with its wake. Probably not destroyers. Anok, do you feel the court martial of Indianapolis captain was the same miscarriage of justice as Kimmel's court of bar? A means to take attention off the misdeeds of superiors. Yep. The US Navy has a lot of politics trouble in World War II. Uh, 900 questions. How often does Warrior have to be taken to into dry dock preservation work inspection as a whole? Uh, they haven't done it recently. I think it's. I think it's coming up. I think it's also the same issue as Belfast. Both of them have got it coming up and they're working out how to do it. I don't Remember, Dr. Locke, I'm sure I am on a watch this summer. I'm trying to find a penalty for ground fare for warship. Um, basically, it depends. If you manage to catch it and sell it to your government, it's not called Grand Theft Warship. It's called it, 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 it's um, called reasonable uh, reasonable income. It's a prize. Point Martin Emily, I love the Hangar Magazine arrangement for the county. I'm. Fairly sure that's sarcasm. Hear me. Uh, tracker needs to be behind the hangar, so they put the door on the port side and just swing the hel helicopter out of the other side to move it to the flight deck. Yeah, it's um, fun. Magazine stores 24 to 7 missiles and takes up two thirds of the main deck. Yeah. MC 38 if the US Navy built a response to the Kirov class battleships instead of the Iowa class back on uh, class back in line, would the RN and Fr uh, French Navy want to build battle cruisers too? That's an interesting one. Not sure about the French, but the British might build one. Uh, the British might build one. Th 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 there's a curious reason for that, because you see then especially if the u.s navy are building them at that period and it's sort of 1970s 80s and the british of course are building the invincible class and they're getting out of the carrier game and all those things building one would be a good ego trip for the royal navy and the government they might actually do it it'll be a good it would be seen as a one-off expense to have a nuclear powered surface escort a surface ship like that so they might end up with one.
I wrote that Pan Martin Emily. Overall, the ships weren't that short lived. They were never really that cable fire anti aircraft warfare, but worked all right as flagships. Yeah. Colin Cameron. HS Glaggo was 90, but it was about 90% tint when I dro uh, drove past last weekend. Does that mean she's almost ready for the water? Mm, potentially, or potentially they're having some fun with the paint, getting the paint to dry. Thomas Hobart. Hello, Thomas. Why do Italian battleships have so had so inconsistent guns in World War Two, and how they what the, how did they try to improve that? It's the quality of the manufacturing of the shells. It's quality control, and honestly, they didn't do enough. Someone needed to go to the shell manufacturers and to probably start shooting people, either that or waterboarding them. Nothing particularly, uh, okay, maybe just holding them to natural construction standards, but something needs to be done by them. They were completely not, not um, completely whack out. Uh, nice one. Why haven't the UK government accelerated production type 26 and other frigates and other uh, frigates in the way to Russia's war in Europe? Uh, because the Treasury don't want to spend any money they don't they can think they can get out of not spending. And because honestly, the only programs you can actually put money into and actually start getting delivery of anytime soon are probably the Navy and the Air Force to an extent. The army that would also sharp the big problems in the army programs because the only army program we can stick money into and start getting things out sooner uh, soon enough is Boxer. Which we frankly need to do, because Ajax isn't going to work anytime soon. So if you really want to stick with Ajax, you need to start getting a boxer delivered, and preferably a version of boxer with a gun turret and a, a some sort of jet anti tank guided missile system on top, um, uh, to be useful as well. But you know, we'll see what happens. And the, the thing I find annoying is I actually don't disagree. The Ajax concept is good. It's the 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 whole procurement process has mucked that one up. That him. The excerpt from Ashwell's book talks about a Japanese destroyer being there too. Hmm. Where is it? The clock. Did the RAF ever consider a massed heavy bomber strike on German fleet during the war? Uh, they didn't just consider it. They tried it out several times. In fact, they tried it out at the beginning of the war, and by the time the heavy bombers turned up. The German fleet wasn't there. My hair Productions. This is a long shot. Uh, Trump has sent to release two Belfast kits in the future. 1943 and 59 version. Do you know anyone who might be working on those? Keen to know wh when they're coming. Seen test build photos. Ooh. Send me a um, Discord. I've got a friend who might know. Oh yeah, you okay, Melmy? Right, it's almost ten o'clock, so I will say that ten I will be going in because I've got to walk the fluffy research assistant still. He needs an extra walk before bed this evening. I've just been reminded it's flushed up on my stream. I've got WhatsApp working on my computer now. Don't have to check my phone now, it works. Um And as Palmer and Emily's point out, to go fast you need more people, and those take a long time to train. Mm -hmm. That is probably the bigger problem. But we we have been upping our training for the last couple of years for the Navy. It's making sure you have the construction people that, that you need more people as well for. That moment. also, uh, when looking at Nelson, when looking at International's family, his dad was Captain Major Ken at the time, and his younger brother Peter was a midshipman on the Dorsetshire. Yeah. They said Fox said, is there another ship designation like Frigate that has fallen out of use and returned with completely different meaning? Or have just mutated so that its role has become completely different? Not currently in service, but the interesting one is there was a long time when um, Rake was a ship, 
and it came in and out a few times of various written roles. MC Lucia put in, if a battle cruiser or two was actually built in that time, Argentina would be shaking their boots in 1982. They'd certainly be worried about it. Would be a lot of missiles. Also, how good of battleships were Fuzonese class uh, ships when they were not even armored against their own guns? They weren't bad. Remember, the the Japanese are always leaning towards accent the fast battleship concept. They're always leaning to accent towards it. So they're sort of they they they're built on mobility warfare lines, and that's different. They, you you have to remember. The Royal Navy and German Navy are stuck building for a Jutland-style scenario, and for some reason the US Navy starts thinking that yeah, they're going to fight that off their coast. Um, but the Japanese are never so inclined at because let's consider for Japan, everyone else's battle fleet is a long way away from them. It's going to be a lot of maneuvering to get there and deal with it. So it produces a slightly different design emphasis. Um... Ba, 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 ba. Now, if the RN has four to five Malters, do they still pursue the Invincibles in the 70s? Does the pre their presence mean the supersonic Harrier is more or less likely? Suppose that one's down, uh, down to who's in government. It, down to who's in government as the Invincibles unlikely. Four to five Malters, if they're still in service in the 70s, then the Royal Navy has a very major carry but um and they are built around buccaneers and phantoms if they have anything and probably e3 uh, e2 hawkeyes that's sort of that's coming at some point that was good i just removing any time soon when talking about ajax good concept but the army got uh, got a lemon the lord yep i do have words of the treasury people don't always listen to me nice so well sadly enough I think the combat record of Fuzoni is a quite good, of way, a good way of telling how good they were. They were harbor queens for a reason. They were harbor queens because by the time they were actually fighting a war and actually able to be in the war, the war was uh, they were no longer anywhere reaching its capability. If Fuzoni had been, I don't know, part of the Grand Fleet in World War One, mm, they would not have been harbor queens. They would have been a very useful ship. Do not judge a ship by the war it ends up fighting, judge it by the war it was supposed to fight. When a ship is 20 years old and it's fighting a war it wasn't designed for, it's no longer as useful. Yes, that does affect our memory of it and that does affect its evaluation and its response, but is it their fault that that ship lasted so long in service? No. The, ja the Japanese wanted an 888 strategy. No sh eight, sh eight battleships, eight battle cruisers, never more than eight years old. The Fuso and Ezeis were supposed to be useful for eight years, not 20 years. So, no, no, what warship class was the biggest lemon? Not Vasa or something like that. Mm, no. Uh, biggest lemon? Don't mean so many. Honestly, the biggest lemon is probably the Kirov class, uh, not the Kirov class, the Kiev class, um, the Russians' first generation carriers, and that's mainly because they were designed around an aircraft, the Forger, which was just... If the Ottoman battleship had gone sunk, how did the Iron explain to that, uh, that to the Ottomans? Well, because they're not going to give it to the Ottomans, even if it doesn't get sunk, because they're at war with the Ottomans, so they're not going to explain it. Jamef, the 1943 version of Belfast is already available. Cool. I'm still looking for it. If the Iron had the, built the six Lion class battleships, what would the successor actually look like? Would they have 12 16 inch or 9 18 inch guns? That would depend on whether the RN has learned of the existence of Yamato or not. If they haven't, and there is a P there is peacetime still reigning, probably they'd be trying to go to 12 16 inch. But if they think there's wartime soon, maybe the 9 18 inch. 
the forger, the act forger. The Seneca Pacific Squadron blunders uh, caused the entirety of Europe to declare war. How long can Russia hold out? Mm, let's see. Uh... Ooh. Well, they'll be fighting. Let's say if the French, the, uh, the French, the Germans, and Austro-Hungarians are providing the ground troops going up, and Sweet, uh, and probably the Swedes. Um, that's uh, not good. As long as it depends. If it's during winter, if it's if by the time they get round to organizing and launching the attack, it's winter. That will give the give the Russians another six months. If it's spring, then it'll be about six to eight months. Um, Gino, what ships and where did um, Jellico want eight battleships and eight battlecruisers in the East Asian fleet by 1924? Um, he was planning on them being based in Trim Connolly. And basically, the idea was that you would have a fleet. Uh, the, 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 don't believe the numbers, okay? So, right. You're honestly supposed to believe that Jellico wanted a Royal Navy of eight battleships and battlecruisers in the far in, in the in the indian ocean 16 battleships in the mediterranean uh, eight battleships and eight battlecruisers in the atlantic okay roughly speaking now that would be 48 capital ships which is more than he has in the grand fleet he ain't that stupid okay so, what's he really asking for? What's he really thinking? I think he's more likely expecting a fleet of 24 vessels. Uh, 24 to 27 vessels. Probably nine battleships in the Atlantic Mediterranean. Probably five battleships in the Atlantic and four battlecruisers. And probably the same size force in the far in sort of the base in the Indian Ocean. So you would probably be talking about a force which is more 19 battleships and eight battle cruisers overall. Thomas Howarth, um, what's the deepest confirmed dive of Type 7 or Type 9 something during World War II? I have no idea off the top of my head. I do have a book coming which should tell me. That thing with multiple small independent jet lift engines, we won't get into the forger. Rafa is it? Leave the forger alone, not everything can be Harrier. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm playing my family. To be honest, I want to say Moscow is far worse than Kiev. No! It's a helicopter carrier. It's fine as an escort carrier, anti submarine warfare ship. It's fine. It Basically, it's a, la a ship with a large flight deck for helicopters. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Yes, it's nutty. Yes, it's weird, but it's still better than a ship which is, you know, you're designing with such a, around such a bad aircraft. That you are literally showing, literally treating it as we are bolting a flight deck onto the side of a cruiser. That is what they built. That is the Kiev class. A flight deck bolted onto the side of a cruiser. Right. It's now 10 past 10. I am going to finish this and say good night and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for all the support. Thank you for all the, sh uh, the kind words and the chatting. Um, I hope you've had a nice time, and I hope you've enjoyed.
And I said, I've got to go walk the fluffy research assistant and make sure he's happy. Just in Moscow was a more honest ASW designer. Kia seemed to have been verging on interwar Japanese heavy cruiser design. If Kiev is the answer to the question, you have to ask yourself, where did you word the question? MC Lisha 30 inch. If the RR Navy built, actually did build one to two battle cruisers in the late 70s, what would their class be called and what names or names would they be likely to give them? Uh, it's quite, quite simple. They'd transfer the CVA1 names over to them. So they'd be Queen Elizabeth and Duke of Edinburgh. Or something around that lines. Duke of Edinburgh is always a possibility one. I think it's unlikely. Um, so probably either pr possibly Prince of Wales, but there again, the legacy of World War II was still quite strong at that point, and no one really liked that name. Uh, so possibly King George V. Queen Elizabeth and King George V could be all of it. All sick. King George VI. Yeah. This was what are symptoms that tell you there's something deeply wrong with the service navy past or present? When the people being promoted are not the people who are asking questions of power. The moment they start only promoting yes men, there is something going wrong. What modern design specs or systems would that make would make sense today? Would not make sense in nineteen twenties through to nineteen forties. Hmm. The entire electronic warfare suite we build today, because in the nineteen twenties and forty, it's in the nineteen forties. It's optical, fire and control. So why are you so worried about electronic warfare capabilities and counter electronic warfare countermeasures? Take care, George Newman. Thank you, Melanie sixty fourteen ninety. Uh, take care, Carl Gasberg. In terms of India made them. India made it work by basically taking everything off and trying to turn it into a carrier and then fitting it with decent aircraft. Take care, DG forty. Thank you, Desert Foxo. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Pi Martin Emily. Thank you, Nighthound Productions. Thank you, Rob Razak. AMC Legend thirty H. Thank you, Nancy Going Around One. Renowned as an SSBN at that time, she is. Um, C A de McGovern. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, Bill Wong, thank you. John Shea, thank you. Dirt Squad, thank you. John Farrow, thank you. Carl Gosworth, thank you. Thank you, Vision. Thank you, Bird Guy 829. Thank you, Paul Amos. Thank you, Graham Hound, uh, Malaga. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, Tizzy. Thank you very much. Tafra, Anuk, what about Tafra? He need a walk too? No, he's sleeping. He's had a walk today, and as said, also he was providing 16 of the 20 kilograms in my backpack while we were doing our run slash walk slash <clears throat> trying to kill ourselves. <sighs> Thomas Hoboff, thank you. And Tana Verka, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Take care and have a nice evening. And I hope you enjoy tomorrow's video because it's going to be a good long patrol. Take care, Ron. Let me you, why 20 kilogram in the backpack? Well, I had a 20 kilogram weight vest I was carrying. I had a backpack which was loaded with four kilogram, which was the doggy carrier, which had four kilograms of weight attached to it because it can do, and that's upon my sort of endurance training I've got doing at the moment. And it had a 16 kilogram corgi in it to make it up to 20 kilograms, plus two liters of water. And some chocolate bars in a pouch that the corgi couldn't get to. It was good exercise. Uh, there is a little video on the Instagram, I think, of me doing some practice with it a couple of weeks ago. So you can see what it looks like. Take care, everyone, and have fun. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. And take care. I come back and you go away, Vision. I'm sorry. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Seriously, sometimes this chat is so weird. 
Yes, I was carrying, well, I had 20 grid open weight vest. I had more than 20 kilograms in the back, backpack. Yeah, 40 kilograms. It's a good endurance, it, it's a good endurance training. A few hours, uh, five hours walking, hiking, sort of with my friend uh, between Headley around Boxtel and that area. And then um, finishing off with a run through Headley to get back to our cars because we ended up racing. I explained it at the beginning if you want to hear how I tortured myself. Take care, everyone. Have fun and enjoy.